If you want to do the whole thing. And then I threw the Senate out in the whole thing. That joke. And coming in the middle of a conversation. That's classic podcast stuff. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Tap Calf Transmissions, where we talk about uh, all things Star Wars, but specifically Star Wars books. Uh, last time was our first episode with Trusa Bakura, and today we're going to be talking about X-Wing Rogue Squadron. I am Corey from Corey Loses, Corey's Datapad, and Theron's Revenge, because I need to plug everything right now. Uh, joining me, as always, like our first episode, is my co-hostess with the mostest. Well, mine was mostly plugging my stuff, and yeah, yeah. Well, I figure if I'm just going to mention your name, you're free to do whatever plugs you want right now, too. But <laughs> well, you've got the Twitch channel with uh, SimCity Four as well. You can't hear, Eck? Some people are saying they can hear you. Some are saying they can't hear you. So I'm going to fix that, I guess. Uh... That's good. But you can hear me, so. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Yeah, can you hear us now? Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. So do we, should we, should we start the whole thing again? Because I messed up my recording anyway. Yeah, because I, I was getting some, uh, some echo, so I just restarted the whole thing. All right, you want to, want to lead us into another intro and we'll just pretend that that never happened? Yeah, I think now, okay. I think now we can both be heard. It, I just turned on everything, everywhere, and it should be working now. Okay. So I'll yeah, give it a okay. sec so we can get some confirmation from the uh, from the chat, if possible. Someone just said "lol." Now Corey muted. I'm hoping they're just. Yeah. No, it was like that for a sec, but it, we should okay. be good now. Okay. okay cool. So with all that out of the way, <laughs> now I I gotta re or live up to the original intro. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. Oh well. We'll we'll make a funny little quip about it. Hello there, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Tap Calf Transmissions, our Star Wars podcast, where we talk about all things Star Wars, but specifically Star Wars books. Uh, last time in our first episode, we talked about the truce at Bakura, and this week we're going to be talking about X-Wing Rogue Squadron. I am Corey, and my co-host, as always, is Mr. Eckhart Slatter. Dude, that intro is actually unbelievably clean. Like... I don't know. Did you have that written down somewhere? Or did you just crush it live that first was time? Me crushing it live. Uh, that's going to be on some sort of stream highlights thing later tonight. Dude, that was that was clean. I got to say, especially it wasn't. Yeah, there that was two point five. This is really episode two point five. We did have a bit of audio the last issues. Episode. But, yeah, Start. the last episode. Um, we'll recreate it live when we get to a uh, hundred episodes and have our live show. Yep. Well, uh, I guess to start off here. Uh, this there was a few questions in the chat uh, about why Eckhart isn't live on his channel right now. The way this is going to work and uh, has worked in the past, even though it's only been one episode, is <laughs> we're alternating who's hosting the episodes 
So the first episode was live on Eckhart's channel. This episode is live on mine. And our next episode will be on June 27th and will also be live on Eckhart's channel. And then afterwards, uh, we're both recording and it'll be available on both channels after the original airing. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, that's what we're trying. And I think it's, I quite like that because next day you can get it on either channel, but it gives, you know, Corey's got a cozy little space over here. It's nice to stop by once in a while. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think it works out well. This podcast is not brought to you by any specific drink manufacturers, but I will be drinking during this podcast. Oh, very professional well, nice. of me because I'm yeah. very thirsty. But uh, in addition to watching this on the YouTube channels, we do have a podcast form from Popular Demand Now. If you want to listen to this in audio form only, uh, maybe on your commute, maybe on the toilet, maybe on a walk. We are available on Podbean and Spotify. If there's any other platforms you guys think we should be on, uh, then let us know as well, and we'll do our best to get in as many places as possible. Uh, but there's links in the description to the audio podcast form, whether you're watching this in the live stream format or the, uh, the YouTube VOD format. And there's also links to both of Eckhart's channels down there right now as well. Nice. Thank you, Corey. You're welcome. Now, make sure the check doesn't bounce this time. <laughs> um, but yeah, we are trying out kind of some new stuff. You'll notice when we when you look at our stuff on Podbean or Spotify, it's all very raw, very new. So if you have any ideas for a good logo, um, anything like that, make sure to let us know. And again, as Corey said, um, let us know which platforms you prefer to listen on, just because it takes a while to get approved for iTunes or wherever else. So just let us know. Um, where to focus on. I believe iTunes is like dying, so. Yeah, they're they're definitely killing it off, but it, they've still got the Apple Music or whatever, and I think Apple Podcasts would be part of that. But, uh, yeah, so. Should we start? Th that would probably be a good idea. Yeah, Our we've been rambling, so. <laughs> you can see on the thing, and also on the camera now, is X-Wing Rogue Squadron by Michael A. Stackpole. Uh, so an X-Wing, for those of you who may not be aware, is a type of starfighter uh, common in the Star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. but, Very uh, common, I'd say. Yeah, so if well, you for to... military starfighters. And also some police work, because Corsac right. uses some as well. That's right. That's but, right. But we're jumping the gun a bit. Yeah. Um, so some some basic background. 1996, book one of the X-Wing trilogy. Um, I'd say we talked about this last episode, but I'd say one of the most positively um, anticipated, you know, big arcs of Star Wars. Did I say X-Wing trilogy? I meant X-Wing series. Um, how many books are there in total, Corey? I want to say there's eight, but I could be off on that because they did mm -hmm. add, there was the original set and then there's right. uh, It's there's Our like Revenge four. a little bit after that. Yeah. And then you have Mercy Kill, which is set 30 years after. Right. Yeah. So there's a bunch. And as he kind of got at, they cover quite a, you know, quite a period of time with Mercy Kill being basically right up at the very end. So um, and what's interesting, too, is just the amount of I mean, it's it's not Thrawn level in that, you know, it sets up a lot of what's to come. But X-Wing really does bring in a lot of characters that are like a big part of Legends moving forward. Um, obviously Corin and you know whoever else. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I guess we should cover the book briefly for those who haven't read it. Yeah, so we're still kind of playing with the overall format for the show. Uh, last time we did kind of uh, a breakdown of all the major characters and then kind of went through the book uh, almost not quite chapter by chapter, but section by section, and that mm -hmm. was the overall format. We're going to try to do it a little bit different today, uh, go over the major points of the book first and then kind of go off in whatever direction the discussion leads uh, with different parts of the book. Just to kind of see how it goes each way. If you guys have any feedback on that, feel free to mm -hmm. let us know as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so the book starts off with a discussion of Wedge trying to reform Rogue Squadron and recruiting new pilots. Uh, I guess the, the main character of the book would be Corrin, uh, mm -hmm. although it's from a bunch of different perspectives. So there's chapters that cover different characters but uh, Corrin Horn, who is a future Jedi Master and one of the new pilots of Rogue Squadron, is uh, 
is uh, gets most of the focus here. Yeah, I'd, I'd say for the non-imperial sections, he's probably like seventy five percent, or maybe yeah. even more. We he do get a few wedge chapters. Wedge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if Corin's there, Corin is typically um, he's typically the one we're seeing the world through. And he's an interesting character. So he he comes from Corsac or the Corellian security force. Um, and yeah, now he's he's basically a hotshot pilot. The book starts off with him uh, running this simul- simulator called the Redemption Scenario, which, coolly enough, is based on actual level from the old Star Wars X-Wing game. And the whole book kind of takes on a sort of Top Gun in space. Um, and I mean, everyone who's read it kind of makes that connection because you're dealing with squad dynamics, you're dealing with the um, factional dynamics. So you've got the other military leaders who you're always kind of jostling up against. And then of course you have um, a pretty clear cut bad enemy in the empire. And I guess ultimately is on Isard. Yeah. So uh, I guess I should also say if it wasn't already obvious for anyone who is just reading through the series for the first time, uh, we are going to be talking about some points of it that uh, are more or cover plot elements from the later books as well in the series. So if you're concerned about character spoilers, then mm-hmm. uh, you may want to wait until we've covered the whole series or finished Star Wars. Before First four books. Because but, <laughs> yeah. there are some, there's, I guess, one spoiler that's, I mean, the book's from 96. You should have read it by now. But well, people are the, very concerned about Game of Thrones spoilers, and the first that's true. came out probably before Rogue Squadron. But uh, uh, yeah, I think so. But yeah, so there's a there's a big discussion of the the sim scores being one of the bases for uh, how they're picking the pilots, but they're also mm-hmm. trying to form Rogue Squadron as a symbol because it was uh, the pilots were involved in uh, Battle of Yavin. Battle of Hoth, Battle of Endor, basically all the major cinematic battles we got from the Rebellion era, and Wedge is in charge of the squad now. And aside from just the military implications of having a really well-trained squadron, they're trying to build up this symbol that has a bunch of elements from the Alliance all put into one. Uh, so you end up with uh, trying to get a as diverse set of interests as possible. So you have two Corellians, two Typharans, which is a planet that produces Bacta, and they have representatives from each of the major Bacta-producing companies, which becomes very important as a Don't worry. We've got thing. Bacta politics coming. Oh, if you are concerned about healthcare policy, this is the Star Wars book for you. <laughs> but uh, representing Zaltan and Zuckfra corporations, I have both of them spelled with a Z as X and Zuckfra, uh, but that's Jace Brewer and Arisi Delaret. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you they're have both kind of nasty individuals. Yeah. Well, uh, they're they're just not super pleasant. Yeah. Jace is more likable, I think. But Jace is just well, Corin if the book wasn't about him. Exactly. Yeah. And even Corin seems kind of self aware about that at some times, but his mm-hmm. way to justify the fact that he's a uh, kind of a raging asshole for the first half of the book, <laughs> a huge narcissist, was that at least he's not Jace. Which, yeah. if your justification for you not being an asshole is like, at least I'm not this other person. It. Nah. Yeah, Jace isn't even like. We you hear more about how Jace is like unpleasant than you actually see Jace doing like nasty stuff, and on one occasion, well, I, I guess we'll get there. But on one occasion, he actually seems to be a pretty okay guy. Yeah, he's he's full of himself, but he's not really. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? He's not malicious. He's yeah. kind of like an X-Wing version of Raynar Thal, is what it came across yeah, that's to me. Not a bad, it's not a bad example, actually. Which, that's a reference we'll get to. Hopefully <laughs> like never. Two years. <laughs> probably quite significantly longer. We've got 19 Jedi Order books, new Jedi Order books oh. to go through. Well, we'll probably that's start like... grouping some stuff together, you'd think. Or... Corey. No. Okay. <laughs> Well, we're, we're doing an no, episode we, for uh, each of the Young Jedi Knights books, too, right? Oh, yeah, and Junior Jedi Knights. It's going to be... Oh, strap yourselves in, guys. This is going to be great. Uh, but yeah, so they have a bunch of these different interests represented in the squadron, which is kind of interesting because you have the Corellians. You have two Corellians, uh, including Wedge and Corrin, 
who are there's a lot of Corellian representation within the alliance, even though at this point the Corellians are still part of the empire and then they become independent. So they're not really part of the New Republic until uh, 12 ABY, I think, 11 or 12. Yeah, yeah. And they're used as this symbol here. There's also a Corellian representative on the Provisional Council. Uh, you have the two Typharans, even though Typhara is, bec- is uh, trying to stay neutral. neutral. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to include Arisi and Dror, uh, Dror, Jace, mm-hmm. uh, find his names there. But they're <laughs> trying to con- use that to kind of convince the Typhara and Bacta companies to join and support the New Republic. Then you have a Rodian, a uh, Shistavinian, which is basically a wolf person. Uh, <laughs> where, where the wolf girl Very political, politically correct. <laughs> they call him Wolf Man every, like, Time in the book, and I want to see what a wolf woman looks like personally. Was the that guy in the Clone Wars cartoon? Was he a Shistavinian? Um, I don't remember to be honest. Anyways, there's also a Twi'lek, a Gon, a Bothan, uh, some a uh, refugee from Kessel, and mm-hmm. someone from Bespin. Uh, right. The Gond is basically. You were very passionate about this. I, I feel like you should. Yeah, know. Oral's the Oral. He's the dude. Uh, first of all, he's super polite. Um, he's just a real sweet fella. Uh, he's a pretty good pilot too because he he, he usually flies as Corin's wing. Um, he keeps up with them all the time. And later on, uh, Corin's uh, what what do they call the the smaller parts of a squad again? Flight. Uh, flight. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So Corrin's flight, it gets doesn't it get cut in half, and it's just Corrin and Oral. Yeah, because uh, uh, Lujane died. Lujane was yeah, part Lujane, of his yeah. flight. She dies, and then and uh, Hui, the Rodian. Oh yeah, they die as well. Right. Well, I th- I think during that battle they get evac and then die. But anyways, uh, the flight just ends up being cut down to Corrin and Oral, and right. Oral just is the best. Yeah, and he well, we'll discuss more when we talk about how the book treats <laughs> treats women, which is well, it's a nineteen ninety six Star Wars book, so as you'd expect. But uh, Oral is the ultimate wingman, not only from a starfighter perspective, but basically near the end of the book. And I know I'm jumping a lot. Um, Mirax, uh, Corin's future wife, um, is on base with them, and Oral has been injured. He gets he literally loses an arm. For the boys and girls. Or I don't remember if they're girls on the squad at the same time. But he loses an arm. And he's like, oh, I'm going to be in the back to tank tonight. Or in the uh, in the infirmary tonight. So if you want a uh, spare bed, there's one right next to Corrin. And Merrick's is like, sure. And that setup, which could have something that could have been a very friendly night between the two. but Yeah, so Eckhart thinks this is Oral being a real wingman, but I have an alternative interpretation. I don't know which is correct, (laughs) but he could have said something like, hey, you could stay in my bed tonight, and Mirex just assumes that he means the bunk in the room with Corrin, but he could have been talking about his back to tank. So I don't want to jump to assumption. That's true. But I mean, can't Gan not even take off their breathing apparatus so won't that that would be i don't know there's some difficulty there well i just anyway let's we should probably get back to the state of the galaxy <laughs> we've been off about again um <laughs> anyway uh, so we're seven aby i think they say it's just it's just over two years right so it's early seven aby or it's like two and a half years from uh, battle of endor yeah so uh Three out of ten Picard worlds. Was right before. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, you can. No, go ahead. That, that's helpful context. Yeah, just to well. uh, sort of set up the comparison to our last book here. That was about two and a half, three years earlier. And mm-hmm. uh, New Republic is making a lot of progress. You were just about to go into that. so. Yeah, so they actually get pretty specific into the world building. They say that three out of ten worlds are an open rebellion. Um, some of them have, you know, ousted the Empire, others not quite. Um, two out of ten worlds are supportive. And then five out of ten planets are against the New Republic. The problem is the Empire is really fractured at this point um, because Palpatine really has a lot of sector governors and um, 
other really powerful individuals controlling large swaths of the galaxy. So this is where all the warlords come from. So the fact that the Empire is not unified, even though the New Republic only has a relatively small military, they're one of the most powerful in the galaxy. Um, because it's, you're not just fighting the Empire, really. They're fighting, for example, uh, Isard's Empire in these books, and she claims legitimacy largely because of kind of the line of secession and who she killed and the fact that she holds Coruscant. But then there's also Zinj flying around uh, with a super star destroyer. There's a bunch of other warlords. Um, so that's what's keeping them basically at one point, I think wedge even says if there weren't warlords, we'd be pushed as far away from the core as possible, but because they're so distracted with infighting, they can operate pretty freely. Yeah. And this is a, a lot of the first references to, some of those major characters. Like, I think this would be the first place where Zinj was yeah, introduced, I was think- just kind of as a background name that gets mentioned, but he becomes very important later on, obviously. Yeah, I was trying to remember whether Zinj is mentioned at all in Ron, um, just like as a bit of world building, but I don't think so. I don't think so, because like Makati got mentioned with that. Yeah. Uh, and like Warlords were kind of thrown around by the Thrawn trilogy, but I don't think it was. Yeah, I, I don't think Singe right. was named yet. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you're correct. But, uh, yeah, so the Thrawn trilogy, while it was set about four or two years after this, was mm-hmm. written much earlier. Yeah. So it kind of had the first say in setting up a lot of what became fleshed out by a lot of these books that we're talking about now. So the truces at Bakura of the world and the X-Wing rogue squadrons of the world. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Oh, actually, somebody somebody had a good point in the chat. Um, Courtship of Princess Leia actually comes first. Um, I didn't realize that book was published in 94, which is really odd because I guess Zinj is introduced as he's killed, and then the later books fill in backstory. That's super weird. I didn't realize that. Yeah, for some reason, I thought that was published after a lot of the X-Men. So did I, yeah. Huh. But there you go. Well, uh, we, we learned something today. Thank you, chat. That's not uh, that's not too rare with Star Wars stuff. Like, no, did we know Mara Jade was in uh, was in the movies? Yeah, um, there's lots of little fun details like that. It makes the universe very small. <laughs> yeah, uh, Laren Crefe, the uh, Both and Admiral who plans the ill-fated attack on Borlaeus, the first mm-hmm. ill-fated attack on Borlaeus in this book, uh, where mm-hmm. the the New Republic or the Rebels, whichever you prefer to call them at this point, yeah. uh, is going to be attempting to use Borlaeus as a way to get into uh, into the core, and specifically Coruscant. So, mm-hmm. uh, one of the weird things that I that I noticed was that they mentioned Borlaeus and that area as being a good jumping off place to get to the corporate sector mm-hmm. and how you get there from the core and why it, was it doesn't really make board. sense. But like Borlaeus is up this mm-hmm. way. And yeah. This will be reversed for you guys. But this is up this way, and then the, and corporate, the corporate sector, sector is the opposite east. side as north as yeah. possible. And they say to the yeah. corporate sector and beyond. There's very yeah. little beyond the corporate sector. But, yeah, I feel like it was just like that's just a word they had yeah. from the Han Solo stuff. So it was like Another okay, throwaway mention that just... exactly. And then at some point, some idiot. I'm joking, but somebody was like, "Well, let's actually figure out how this stuff works," and you know. Sometimes little lines like that, like the corporate sector being a thing that existed, you know, doesn't really work for a specific sentence in a specific book. Mm-hmm. We get that with the Clone Wars a lot. Like at one point in the Clone in this book, uh, it talks about Corrin's grandfather being involved in the in the Clone Wars, and I forget. I think he's talking to Mirax, and Mirax assumes based on that line alone that that means that he was a Jedi. Um, which kind of suggests at one point the idea was that the Clone Wars had Jedi um, either as the good guys or the bad guys fighting. Um, so a lot of the like a lot of the Bantam era stuff, especially early '90s, and we we'll see this a lot when we read um, the Jedi Academy trilogy, gets pretty broken um, with later lore. But that's okay. Yeah, uh, Corrin's family is his family history is kind of. Do you want to go to, into that now? Do you want to leave that for? Um. Yeah. Go ahead. So, it could be an I Jedi discussion, but uh, yeah. But I mean, it is well. There's allusions to Corin's powers in this book. Yeah. So, uh, Corin, our good friend and main character here, 
his grandfather, so he thinks he's a horn. He technically is a horn, mm. but uh, his grandfather yeah, was Nisha Halcyon. That's what we learned. <laughs> his grandfather was Nisha Halcyon, who was a Corellian Jedi, which it has its own little foibles compared to the rest of the Jedi, which are kind of an independent so thing. But uh, you, get, you get a special coin. Yeah, special coin, which you can give to all your friends when you're promoted to master. <laughs> you can take your family picture and then hang your coin from the fridge. But mm -hmm. uh, so Corrin's biological grandfather was a Jedi who was killed during uh, either the Clone Wars or Order 66. I forget. I think it's the Clone Wars. I think, they, doesn't he get killed by a dark Jedi? I forget. It's been a while since I've looked into Nisha's backstory, but uh, God, oh, that's bizarre that you don't know this all off the top of your I'm head. Sorry, it, I'm a fraud. <laughs> I have to. So when I make my videos, I actually do this thing where I have to like go back to books and look in them again for the information rather than just spewing. Wow, them. it's <clears throat> that's yeah, that's disappointing. But anyways, Nisha dies, and his wife marries uh one of his best friends rostic horn which is uh like it gets kind of weird because yeah uh Nisha and his wife had had a son which is uh hal horn or hal or hal halcyon that was valen halcyon who became mm -hmm. valen horn and then everyone calls him hal horn so he took his adopted name his adopted father's name and then he got married to another horn, so he married his adoptive cousin, from what I can understand, unless the name horn is just so common, like the name Antilles. Uh, Antilles or Solo apparently yeah. becomes, because if you have these two Corellians, why not name everyone on the planet after them? Because again, everyone in Star Wars is related, so why am I even mm -hmm. surprised that they're marrying their cousin? Uh, yeah. And then that is how Corrin is born, so he does have these force powers that he doesn't uh, really know about, but, but the thing about his family is they can't use telekinesis very well. So right, only the only the male children though, because Valen, his son, can't use telekinesis. But his daughter, what's his daughter's name again? Um, uh, anyway, <laughs> she can. So it's like it's a it's a men in the family thing. I don't know. Like, that would be that's like one of the coolest powers too. Like being able to move stuff. It's like the basis for all powers. It's hard. To yeah. Jaisella, yeah. Um, like, can you imagine if Corrin was uh, the one that Yoda and Obi Wan to decide was their last hope, and then Corrin <laughs> ends up on Dagobah? His ex or, crash. He's like, dude, he never makes it to Dagobah because he gets killed by the Wamba. <laughs> 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 he's so useless. Or he's can like, you imagine if 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 he was an Anakin's position, he, ne he never would have been able to woo Padme. With um, getting that peach or whatever it was on the end of his uh, on the end of his fork. <laughs> That's some weird innuendo there. <laughs> that is, yeah, that wasn't. Basically, any movie moment can happen with Corn. Yeah, there should just be a re-edited version of all the movies where it's like, like he can't he can't even use lightsaber throw. He oh, shouldn't be able to use either. force choke, um, force push. It's just it's like he can think inwardly. I, I guess <laughs> he can predict stuff. I guess he can like, how does, how does he become a Jedi master? How does this dude not die? Well, like, we already know that Tion becomes a Jedi master and stream just to make her. So yeah. Tion and, and stream are basically not, it. it's happened. So they don't get their feelings hurt. Basically <laughs> it's like cam's a Jedi master. Oh yeah, he he won't be able to help aim the torpedo, nudge it with the force, doesn't blow up the Death Star. Um, but like, but, what? How does? How is this a thing that he can't do? Like, he can manipulate yeah. the force in other ways, but when he tries to do that, midi chlorine is just like, no, fuck you. I will say that's like such a stupid distinction that never would have happened. Like, say what you will about Legends versus the new canon. At least they've kind of abandoned the Dragon Ball Z style. Um, that the force was sometimes traded. Yeah, I thought the scene where Corrin went Super Saiyan 4 was a little premature in this book. <laughs> yeah, it was really weird that he grew a tail and went <laughs> full golden ape afterwards. Yikes. <laughs> um, we, we were on world building. How did we get here? <laughs> how do we ever get anywhere? Yeah. Uh, uh, so we should talk about how they totally dismissed the Cy Ruby threat almost right. totally. <laughs> the Cy Ruby are killed off screen. 
last even though they're built up as being an existential threat to the galaxy. We were talking last episode about how uh, how they were presented as that big threat, and then you never see them again uh, until these on Vong War, where they're not a threat. They're just mentioned as part of this mm. uh, galactic war where everyone's getting messed up and everyone makes yeah. a cameo appearance. But <laughs> yeah, the, the greatest hits of legends. One of the points that you did bring up before we started recording last time, and then we briefly mentioned in the last episode, was that one of the X-Wing books, uh, which turned out to be Rogue Squadron, uh, on yeah. page 292, I believe. Wow, uh, Corey. They mention, sent, or they use it as kind of like a disciplinary threat that yeah. they would get sent off to uh, attack Ciruvi Stronghold. So there are still right. Ciruvi Strongholds going on two years later. It's just this is all super mm-hmm. off screen in star wars so there was a war yeah. going on with that i was actually surprised reading it directly afterwards how many references there are um it talks about wedge having some of the battle droids painted on his ship mm-hmm. um and i think it talks about how i think there's more but but i think they yeah. mentioned it with like Tycho being there yeah because they're like Tycho. he fought in endor hoth and um yeah the battle for bakura so but our boy Speaking Tycho. Of... Yeah. Are we going to go? No, go ahead. I was just going to say Tycho, who's this famous uh, decorated rebel pilot. He's captured at some point before. And right. although he's allowed to be the uh, executive, executive officer for Rogue Squadron based mm-hmm. on Wedge's request, uh, he's under full security detail all the time. No access to weapons whatsoever. And mm-hmm. even though he gets... Uh, like, he's helping command battles, but all of his orders are getting relayed through other people whenever possible. Yeah. And uh, they're very concerned that Tycho is going to be acting as a spy for the Empire because of his escape from Imperial captivity. Mm-hmm. But uh, little do they know there's an actual spy within Rogue Squadron. Which we'll find out. Is that book four we find that out? I'm not sure when we find it out. Uh, like I, but... For some reason, I just assumed that it was already a known thing earlier on because I guess I I knew about it before I yeah but the there's books. not even any so hints in this one really that's kind of one thing I actually like about Tycho's predicament is um like the brainwashing is meant to be like so complete that they basically like snap their fingers and you like turn imperial so like despite the fact that like by all you know he Tycho does seem to be a real stand up guy he puts his life on the line several times he like when you read the first book the potential of him being an imperial spy like unknowingly is still there just because the brainwashing is so nefarious well my favorite thing about the whole uh the whole plot with there being a spy of some kind whether it's Tycho or who it actually is uh do we do we want to give yeah. that big reveal right now and just say it Sure. It is. Everyone sit down for this. It's a Reese. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, but there's this big concern over Tycho, and they're always so concerned about security, which they have, every, like they should be. It's the military. Yeah. But uh, they have this, uh, this admin droid named Mtree, mm-hmm. which at multiple, at multiple points during the book, he just starts acting super strange. Like the first thing chronologically that happens, I think, would have been when he's on a ship with Tycho and Tycho tells him to shut up three times. Yeah. And he reveals like this extra button and extra functions that are like yeah. super sketchy. And then <laughs> Corin is asking for uh, a part for his X Wing to be uh, requisitioned. He tells him, like, he turns into Watto, basically. And yeah. And it's like, okay, this is clearly an issue. <laughs> Everyone finds out independently, but no one gives a fuck. Like, yeah, it was. I didn't understand. <laughs> That's he's, he's like literally they're like the heart of many of their operations. He knows like about Borlias. He knows everything. They're like, yeah. Sometimes he turns into a junk trader. <laughs> yeah, he's clearly what been used for care? some kind of smuggling or something, or knows, part of illicit knows operations. Everyone. He yeah. knows everything about everything we do. He's he cleared everyone. For, like, yeah. yeah, he's cleared for more information than Wedge half the time. But he's trading as well as like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Can't hold that against him. What's the backstory that he was programmed on on Hoth or something by a pilot or something? I don't I forget. Basically, yeah, but it's pretty Yeah, that the scrounging, was... it's it's I mean, let's oh. let's be honest. This book, it's it's Top Gun. It's not you know, it's not like an intellectual thriller, although it's <laughs> it's not written poorly, um, but it's written very simply. And all most of the intrigue is about, um, you know, how the squadron works and how the different like how the different starfighter squadrons work together um, and some interpersonal stuff. And there is some good, good world building. I'm not trying to rip on things, but yeah, there are some. The plot. <laughs> The the main story really dictates most of the details. Yeah. There's clearly been a leak. <laughs> yeah. Be this droid that acts really no. <laughs> this droid literally tried to buy and sell our X wings. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Oh, so I guess where are we now? We talked about the hollow sim battle, right? Um. Yeah, we talked about the squad makeup. Oh, one thing that really bugged me: why the hell does Wedge get credit for two Death Stars? Because he was there, but that's, he didn't do anything. Really, that's not true. He did things. He acted as an extra shield for Luke, according to him. Okay, that that part is absolutely bizarre, because that like presupposes that they had some knowledge that Luke was this incredible fighter before the battle. Yeah, when, like, like the... he's literally some friggin' swamp kid. Who's like talking about shooting rats with a BB gun or uh, <laughs> shooting rats, <laughs> shooting the rats BB from the back gun. of a station we- a station wagon, and they're like, "Yeah, um, <laughs> Biggs and I knew that we were just extra shields for Luke." Like, okay, maybe when the battle started and he's like flying really well. Like, what's the first thing Luke does in the Battle of Yavin? He does a, a strafing run on the Death Star surface with his laser cannons and almost blows up his X wing. <laughs> This is like the 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 hero savant who's leading the rebellion, and they they're like apparently knew it the whole time. Yeah, the lead up to the battle wasn't like how are we going to get Luke in position to take this shot. It was we're all going to try, and it yeah, may like work, what about maybe? Red Leader? Like Red Leader got there, he just he just screwed it up. <laughs> well, I don't know if he screwed it up. Well, he missed. Yeah, I guess. Uh, let's yeah, not be too hard on Red Leader here. <laughs> yeah. Um. But I don't know. That's just I, that part just struck me as being really weird. And I don't know. I wouldn't give yeah. Wedge credit for both Death Stars. I think you get credit for things you kill. The second Death Star, yes, he could get credit for that. But the first one, I don't know about that one, Chief. If like, Wedge Tycho gets Death the Star? Death Star, then Tycho also gets a Death Star, and Corin gets to paint a Lancer on his X Wing. That's yes. my call right there. But but like then shouldn't everybody at the battle get to paint a lancer on their X wing? Maybe I'm just uh because Wedge was gone. Like let's not let's not forget that Wedge literally peaced out. Luke's like get out of here, Wedge. Wedge's like okay, <laughs> <laughs> nothing you can do. I guess you're right. <laughs> just saying. I don't have a vendetta. I love Wedge. I'm just saying. Yeah, he's uh. Because like Han was out there for both Death Star runs, or yeah, not Han? Han did more did the, the Falcon. End, yeah, but I don't think Han's gonna paint his kills. And I forgot. Him. I forgot Han wasn't in space. To be honest, as well. Oops. Han wasn't in space. Yeah, he was on. He was on Star. Endor. Remember? Oh, I thought yeah. you meant in uh, in Episode Four. Like <laughs> he was walking oh, yeah. on the Death Star. <laughs> yeah, Han was shooting with the blaster from. <laughs> he was from hanging the planet from the of Yavin. <laughs> He's just that good a shot. Yeah. It's kind of it, this book is kind of weird on that note because it is like you know not centered around our main trilogy heroes. We get Leia in the next book. I was thinking she was in this one, but she's not. We get Leia in the next book. Um, there's a lot of Akbar, um, but there's no Luke. Luke gets some references, but he's not in it whatsoever. Same with Han. Akbar's catchphrase in this book is basically just "Can we not?" <laughs> yeah, like everyone else is fighting. Wedge and Horton saw him, every scene they have together. It's like just arguing yeah. the whole time about everything. All Psalm's a real diva. Is, can we not? Yeah. 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 Psalm's a real diva. I, I, I do. 
like I like the idea of you know the Y. Let's be honest, Y wings are kind of lame compared to X wings. So I do like yeah. the idea of the the Y wing um, commander like being kind of a like a tryhard. But well, he's it does justify his position pretty well. Where it's like you have this crack group of hotshot pilots that can yeah. use their own skills, and it's the right call for them. <laughs> but I have basically this class of kindergartners who I need to listen no, to yeah, you right. absolutely or else we're all going to die and nothing will ever get done. But, yeah. Uh, I do. I do, I do like that. That is pretty cool. How like, especially Corin and like Jace can like basically live off their, um, you know, their pure talent alone, but like the Y wings need to be absolutely willing to follow uh, I think they even they doesn't Sam even talk about like like doesn't he tell Wedge she needs to be harsher on rogues on the rogues at yeah. one point because you do get like the first battle of Borlias where um, Corin directly you know goes against orders and he saves them all in the end but like you can't get away with that if you're some Y wing pilot who's like probably an okay pilot but not like like Jesus in an X wing. Yeah, and Sam was gonna try to get uh, get Corin basically court martialed, but then drops it. Yeah, and his main concern was just getting Wedge to institute some kind of discipline, which it does come off as pretty petty in yeah. a lot of it. But the reason that he originally complained was like the rogues technician had during the battle simulators messed with the programming so that when any yeah. of the other pilots got killed by a rogue squadron member, the rogue squadron Big thing quest flushed. would. Yeah. Press, not quest would show quest. up on the, <laughs> on their screen in some way which is a it's a pretty big dick move it's like yeah x-wing zoro like, people like i'm flying here like <laughs> i'm flying <laughs> that was my sense those are my sensors as what they'd call it um now i've got to rely on visual scanning in other words looking at stuff <laughs> <laughs> pick up your visual scanning like doesn't that just mean look at stuff well is that the that's uh, that's just from from a new hope but well I, I every time i read any of the x-wing books or like any books with a lot of fighter combat i just think of the the scanner images from a new hope where uh, i th- it might be invaders as well as luke's but you it's just like 1994 mm-hmm. where's the 1994 video game graphics yeah yeah, and totally. it's like, how how does anyone get anything done with this? This is horrible. Well, this book kind of addresses that because so I, I did a whole bunch of references to how this book really downplays space combat. If you're like one of those people that want Star Wars ships to be the most powerful thing ever, this book is absolutely going to piss you off. Yeah, because like it's very specific about ranges. And at one point, like here, let's see um, uh, two clicks for. Yeah, so two clicks is outside the range of an X-Wing. Most of fighting is done much, much closer because I think they talk about how at um, the Battle of Yavin, they have their X-Wing lasers zeroed at two to to one kilometer, and that's supposed to be way too far. Good for taking out like gun emplacements, but way too far for uh, fighting battles. Um, And then, yeah, at one point it says kilojoules of energy is the output of a laser. And I just have to assume that that's a mistake because that makes literally no sense. That's like a few calories. <laughs> like yeah. through chicken wing. <laughs> um, yeah. But there's also so, uh, the earliest, or I guess the main capital ship combat you actually see, because even at the battle of Borlaeus, there's capital ships there, but they're yeah. mostly bombarding the shield. Uh, yeah. So earlier on in the book, Rogue Squadron gets pulled out of hyperspace by the Black Asp, mm-hmm. uh, which will become important and Karuska Rainbow later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it covers a fight between Rogue Squadron, which is just 12 X-Wings, against uh, the TIE Interceptors as well as the Black Asp itself, which yeah. is a 600-meter-long Immobilizer 418 cruiser. And uh, in one pass, the Rogue's... And their proton torpedoes take down the mm-hmm. shields in the area where they're attacking and take out two turbo laser or two laser cannon emplacements. So they're really quite effective. Like immobilizers aren't the big bads of the Imperial fleet. They're not no. super good for combat. And I 
but it's still they're able to get a lot done with individual squadrons of uh, that kind of felt right to me i don't know why it's just like i do kind of imagine the immobile you absolutely have to protect because most of the power generation is going to like the gravity well generators um but when you take that with the later uh destruction of the is the lancer called ravager uh i think so so they destroy that in one pass of torpedoes like they do highlight the fact that it's going in a very specific spot Mm -hmm. and they're doing very risky stuff to get to it but it's going from full shields to cut in half from this one group of proton torpedoes and it would Mm -hmm. only be about uh they were too short because there were two that still tried to kill Corrin afterwards too oh yeah right because they lock on him yeah, can we also mention the fact that Corn got got shot by an ion cannon? What a loser! <laughs> They're apparently like, very deadly. Yeah, because doesn't I th- I'm pretty sure Mara gets hit by an ion cannon. I think Jaina does too at one point. I th- I'm pretty sure Mara gets hit by an ion cannon, but uh, mm-hmm. like they're always described as being very inaccurate. Um, so for him just being like flying through space and getting yeeted by an ion cannon especially like when he's when they're about to jump to hyperspace i just find really funny yeah they uh but then the fact that he's basically shut down and then kills two tie interceptors i guess Tycho's keeping him busy too but you'd think yeah. the tie in interceptors would be smart enough to at least go for him first but you'd think so they're probably you assuming do. that Tycho has uh weapons which he doesn't because no one trusts him but Mm -hmm. he's still going to be much harder to take down and the x-wing is still a threat it just yeah these are these are not their best and brightest no not not at all the empire is not sending their best and brightest (laughs) no they're not some some bad hombres flying those squints (laughs) you want to talk about nicknames um fighter nicknames uh they're horrible (laughs) yeah (laughs) next up yeah Okay, we'll leave it at that. Well, no, so there's eyeballs for TIE fighters, and it makes sense. It's, you know, a big thing in this, the middle. Dupes for, uh, well, there's a lot of names for the uh, TIE bombers. I don't remember if we get any others in this book, but I think they call them, they basically, you don't want to fly a TIE bomber. Like, you really, really don't. Pretty shit. Um, so I think they, they have various names about them being sitting ducks and stuff. Um, and the, but dupes due to the two, you know, not just the one. Uh, cockpit pod, but also the second one. I, is that for weapons only, or a, the bomber? I don't remember. I've always assumed squints. it's just a whole payload gets kept in yeah, one. I, I think you're right. And then there's squints. <clears throat> there's also brights, which they use for any other kind of advanced model. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure if that would apply to like any other even non-TIE, or if it's just for mm. things like uh, TIE Defenders or whatever, which... Those uh, are bad news. They bring it up later in a briefing, and some of the higher command don't really have... Or I think it's Laren Crefe again, who doesn't mm-hmm. have any idea what he's talking about. So it seems like it's just either X-Wing pilot lingo, because even Horton Song yeah. doesn't love it, but that could be because he's more of a traditionalist. He's kind of a stickler, yeah. 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 Um, the, I do like the how bad command kind of is like the first battle of Borlias is kind of like a gigantic boondoggle. Like it's really bad Intel. And I put that on, well, part of that Psalm and then he's like not, not apologetic afterwards. And like, what do they lose two pilots there or one, but, uh, I think they, they, lose, they lose, uh, maybe not. They lose the Rodian and then, there's two or three who lose their X wings. They do evac. Right, like that's, so that's what Oral is injured. Like, have, yeah, Oral loses his arm. Uh, What's Andorni his name? The lawyer dies. Uh, yeah. Navarro, Ren, Arisi, and Shia. Shio lose their X wing. Yeah, because Shiel. Yeah, because then they do the little for the second battle. They do this thing where they choose who gets to fight. Yeah. Can we talk about the fact that Nawara is like a pretty important character in Fate of the Jedi when he's Luke Skywalker's lawyer? Yeah, he comes up, him and uh, I don't think his wife ever gets 
mention or i guess she does come up a little she, bit in fate of the jedi but yeah she's uh, in, yeah she's not a major character but she's in it it was a pretty big callback to have noir show up again in fate of the jedi yeah. but that's also a lot of authors bringing in their yeah. or their series stuff because that was that was uh aaron alston that wrote yeah the other one and he was the and other he author was who big wrote into, the yeah. uh, x-wing series alongside michael stackpole mm-hmm. uh, which is also why you have karen travis's books uh always having mandalorians from like and bard and jessic showing up in fate of the jedi mm-hmm. or that would be legacy the force yeah but killick or, showing up uh, and everything troy denning writes yeah killick's or yeah it's just it's yeah we'll talk we'll talk about that soon soon in three years but yeah they're yeah. talking about in the chat uh bothans being kind of shit in a lot of places yeah uh, Laren Crefay, obviously kind of incompetent. Uh, I assume Trace Crefay is like his cousin or something. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever I, seen a specific I, I, relation. I feel like it talks about that in... Yeah, maybe, maybe it doesn't... Because I, th- I think he talks about his family in New Jedi Order, but yeah, yeah. he's good. Um, Trace Crefay is good. Uh, yeah. Borsk Falia is horrible for... Yeah, he has like one time. moment where he's not insufferable. But the thing Nothing is, with all this complaining about Bothans in this book and their bad intel, there is a member of the squad who is Bothan. So I don't right. know how much he's actually uh, around for these conversations, or if they're just like trash talking the Bothans. <laughs> just blatantly his back. racist. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets pretty bad at points. It's like, yeah, they they're acting on bad intel, and that admiral's kind of a dick. Or uh, yeah. Laren was a general. Uh, mm-hmm. He's kind of a dick, but they were yeah. planning this whole assault on Borlaeus, where they were using uh, a bulk cruiser, which I think was a Neutron Star class it's been retconned as. Uh, I uh, think so, because Mon... it just calls it bulk cruiser. Yeah. Although, doesn't one of them have, like, a kind of Mon... Yeah, name? that was the bulk cruiser. Mon yeah. something. Yeah, I think, aren't there two bulk cruisers, like a CR-90 and... Yeah, and know. there was the Eviscerate, well, Emancipator. Emancipator, which shows up... I have a whole thing. So the Emancipator shows up later in Dark Empire and gets eaten by a world devastator. So it has big things in its future. Yeah, because it's like the flagship of, I think, the fleet that attacks Imperial Center. Mon uh, Valley, I think. Yeah. Vale, either way. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah. So kind of a, a fun... The, the Bothans are an, are an interesting species. I do like in the the New Jedi Order when they basically declare like full genocide with like no, yeah, no rules against the Vong. That was pretty cool. Mm. Then that keeps going on forever, so they have to make sure the Bothans aren't allowed anywhere near the Vong. <laughs> like they're trying to terraform planets, go away. <laughs> Just <laughs> once I got a vibro blade. <laughs> uh... But the uh, Y wing run. Uh, did you have anything specific you wanted to talk about with the Y wing run? That we haven't. Oh, um, just during the. I guess that's the first battle of Borlias. I just really like that scene where like they're like in the middle of battle and the Y wings just like come through and just like save the day. Um, it's just it's a very usually I don't know about you, but usually I've got trouble like actually imagining the space battles. I kind of just I kind of sometimes just read them and. Just like, okay, there's fighting going on. I don't need to know the specifics. There's lots of looping and dodging and stuff and jinking. Um, but with the Y-Wing scene, it's like kind of like the cavalry going through the battle. You just imagine like the turrets on the top of the Y-Wings just like, you know, crushing fighters. I just thought it was a really cool scene. Yeah, I I had a, I have an okay time usually with like uh, the fighter battles when it's showing from someone's specific mm-hmm. perspective and just what they're doing. But when it's the anything that's broader than that, it usually yeah. is a bit more difficult to picture. Totally. Uh, like specific events, like when it was the ball cruiser crashing, that was fine. But then when they're talking about the evacuation specifically, mm. when Tycho is flying around the uh, evac shuttle thing, that was a bit hard to picture because it's like Orin flew by and marked the place where uh, Oral was. Like, did he just yeah. Sit there? Did he repulse his way over there? Did he yeah. fly past? And be like, hey, you're over here, but it was <laughs> kind of. Did he cut off Oral's other arm and <laughs> wave it with his? Yeah, <laughs> I do like how the uh, the X wings are basically capable of like anything in this. Like, anytime something needs to be done, it's like, oh yeah, the droid can. 
It's like, oh yeah, hyperspace is taking a while, so I had the droid microwave me a hot pocket. <laughs> it's like, seriously, it's, it's just like anything that uh, needs to be done, you just have the droids do it. It works, but I don't know. It, it's kind of cool too. Yeah, it, something that always bothers me with like the the uh, R two units or any astromech mm-hmm. is like everyone complains about how loud they squeal, but then design them that way. I I get the whole <laughs> Star Wars thing where it's like, yeah, the droids can develop their own personality and it's yeah. just how it is. But yeah. there's specific behaviors like that where it's like this was this is a universal trait of them. Someone clearly did this on purpose, and no one has totally. fixed that yet. I do kind of like the idea of sort of, I mean, it doesn't really fit in the lore, but I like the idea of just droids being around for so long. They've just got so many like weird quirks and stuff to their programming, yeah. even on like a, like a big level. It's like, Oh, the, the big droid brain that everyone bases their new models off of was invented so long ago. There's just weird little quirks into it. Yeah. Well, like Whistler is like, Oh, his, his previous pilot. Yeah. Uh, he got this reputation for previous pilot. Like, how dead are those guys? How did he survive? Like, just or just tell the friggin' droid to shut shut up. Whistler, shut up. Like I'm in the middle of battle. <laughs> Be quiet. Um Because my knock seems like uh it does just as much squealing as yeah. Whistler does. And R2 does too, I mean. <laughs> yeah, and they they seem like they're really scared, but at the same time they're giving the most sarcastic comments in the entire Star Wars series. Like they throw astromech droids throw so much shade. It's great. Yeah. But it's They're also kind of lovable me. too. Like I don't know. I I just if I had a, like a sick ass droid buddy like Whistler or R2 or any of the droids, I don't know. I I don't think I'd let them go. I'd be like, "You want to come get a beer or something?" I don't know. Well, yeah, uh Corrin's fixing the X-wing. <laughs> And he almost falls off that time. And then oh, yeah. Whistler catches him with the little pincer arm. It's like, damn, how yeah. strong is that thing? <laughs> I know. What kind of weight are you hiding back there? Like, why, why, do, why do we not have you on the front lines or piloting an X-Wing or something? <laughs> they, they can do it on their own. The pilot is yeah. really n- unnecessary, unless it's a really good one. Well, they talk about that in various books. Uh, I did like a whole video on that. Like, why do they not have more droid-controlled fighters? And usually they talk about, I, I remember randomly, uh, it comes up regarding the eye of Palpatine because Luke knows that the the eye is doesn't have any life forms and is piloted by an AI. So he's like, usually AI are much slower uh, and less creative and less good at even just shooting things down with lasers. Yeah. But the the eye's got the special uh, brain. Uh, the seer. What, I don't remember what it is. It's so stupid. I don't even want to. But uh, but There's yeah, some that one. That, pilots, that though, you could dope. replace with just the astromech and tell the pilot to like any Y wing on pocket. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was specifically thinking about the ones that almost shot Corin, where they oh, had yeah. one job and it was to press their button when told, and it, they they didn't. Yeah, and have you read the Revenge of the Sith novelization? Yeah, because in that they basically treat those tri fighters. They're like, I mean, that book has some. I I really like that book, but it does have some weird some some oddities it's like the droids are making calculations like 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 bajillion calculations a second and it's like well and it's it's like two buzz or two tri droids basically kill obi-wan and anakin almost like why did you not have more of those but i got a whole theory on that um one of my favorite theories to come out of the uh uh the vent of the sith novelization i can't remember if it was about mace windu or kit fisto like this whole thing about how uh, they were clearly not dead because of how they described the Anakin's journey uh, to the yeah. office. Yeah. But I, I haven't read that in so long. That was... I think it was um, done as a joke, but... Yeah. I mean, Pablo said that that book's technically still quasi-canon. Um, so I want to go back and read and see what, what weird things are in there. Hmm. Um, but my theory is that Palpatine liked having organics piloting the starfighters because his eventual goal was to like like govern through the use of the force and you can't do that with droids yeah well battle Um, meditation definitely wouldn't work with droids and that's yeah a big deal for palpatine a big deal for joris sabioff super important character 
Luke Skywalker, uh, <laughs> Tressa. There's another yep. big one that she's going to be coming up in my video on Saturday, actually, just to get more oh. in there. Uh, yeah. Bastila, but I think we're getting a little bit farther off topic now. Well, the the Jedi, like in Legacy of the Force, they use battle meditation or the Jedi meld like every single battle, like all the time. Yeah. And Jason, Jason has like super Sith advanced version where he can like battle meditate across the galaxy pretty much. Yeah. And like, with their, it's like their war meditation. Yeah. Yeah. But he has a ship as well. So. That right. Helps. But does the ship help him with battle meditation? It doesn't not help him. Okay. I haven't read that in a while. I sure there's it, a scene where like he turns when, when he first turns like full Sith and he takes the Kaidus name. He's like looking at a map and he's like trying to point out these battles to the people. He's like, he's like the fleet is going to be moving here. And he's like, why can't you guys see this? And yeah. he realized that he's like developed like battle meditation on the next scale where he can like see not only like tactics, but grand strategy. I, don't know, I thought yeah, that was Jason cool. basically becomes Neo by the end of Legacy of the Force. Yeah. It, it's Jason, pretty bonkers. Yeah. yeah. And Luke still daddies him on like every occasion. Like Luke doesn't kill Jason in the end because he's like, it'd be pretty shitty if I turned bad. Let Jaina do it. <laughs> but like, this is super inappropriate. You know who should do this? Your twin. That would be better like, for everyone. Jason's on the bridge of the Anakin Solo. Luke walks in there and like holds him down with the Force, basically like a version of your older brother like holding you down, like farting in your face. Luke basically does that to Jason, and Jason's like struggling. Man, Jason's been on a five-year sojourn across the galaxy, and Luke's been partying with Mara Jade, and he's still, still <laughs> daddy's Jason, no problem. And then every time they duel, Luke kicks his ass. Like, Luke, like, rips out half of Jason's hair, like, punctures his kidney. Jason's, like, crying in the back to tank, and Luke's like, I could have killed you, but I didn't want to do it in front of Ben. <laughs> I don't I didn't want to be pissed when I did it, basically. A little preview of our... Uh... Like, oh, I can't wait. Fun. I can't wait. <laughs> oh, I mean, man, you, gonna, I love Jason, so close. I. Me too. That's going to be a huge, huge arc for us. The young Jedi Knight to Legacy of the Force thing. That's what Dude, I'm I would, looking forward to. I'd actually be down. How, how long do you think it would take to read all of the? We can we can skip Junior Jedi Knights. Oh wait. Oh, Akrit and Anakin. These are big characters. Uh, and Tahiri. I think we'd have to just read them all. And then that's what I was thinking. Thing. Like, like, how long would that take? Like, I actually have fond memories of the uh, Academy. That's from Junior Jedi Knights, right? Or Young Jedi Knights. Uh, Young Jedi Knights, Young Jedi Knights, Knights is like Jaina and Jason. And, yeah. Junior Jedi Knights is Anakin. They're right? not long books. There's like eight no. of them for each of them, but they're they're really short, big font, so we could probably easily knock it out. We could probably do like two, one or two episodes on like the entire thing. Yeah. Be like, I really like them, to be honest. They're fun. Like, yeah, they're fun and, books. And it's, they're not a, a book series where we're going to be like digging too much into every individual detail. Uh, so it's not like we're going to be missing out on too much if we're talking about like broad strokes, why stuff is important later. But we should probably like show, like when we start talking about Zek, people are going to be like, who the hell is Zek? Well, yeah. you should probably know. <laughs> or like Lobaka. Or like Tahiri. Or like Anakin. Well, not Anakin, but you get the idea. Uh, anything else about Corrin Horn here? Um, interesting bits we got. I have a section here about yikes moments. Uh, well, I guess is we'll there get to anything that else later. you wanted to say about uh, introduction of big EU characters? We kind of talked about uh, Corrin, talked about Warlord Zinj a bit, Isard a little bit as well. Uh, Tycho's a pretty big character. I mean, he moves like into the. I mean, he's not as big as Corrin because like it's it's hard to you can't really over overstate how big of a character corn becomes he's like basically one of the one of the main characters throughout the njo and beyond yeah like he's one of the jedi i would say yeah it's pretty interesting that like he has a bunch of these earlier books where you have stuff from his perspective and then in later books he's around a lot uh, mm -hmm. but you're not quite getting his uh that's true yeah. i jedi 2 perspective yeah that's too bad, actually, because he is a, a fun character. But eventually it's like they knew he was going to be so popular, so they couldn't limit him like they did with because like Tycho is more niche, although Tycho marrying Winter is like the dumbest thing ever. But um, 
Well, not really, but it's it's weird. But um, I, yeah, I don't know. Tycho's. I, I like what they did with Tycho. Like he's still he gets he's in Legacy of the Force. If ever there's a big space battle and everyone's like it's all hands on, you know, Tycho's in a ship somewhere. Yeah, he's never um, really gotten a huge focus. Like he kind of no. does with uh some of the later Rogue Wraith stuff, but yeah, he's got that bit in Legacy of the Force where um. He's like technically working for the Alliance still, but like, remember he goes to the Jedi and they like pretend capture him and yeah, yeah. Um, uh, other than that, I guess the uh, the ter- well, we get Mirax, of course. Yeah, we talked a little bit about Mirax. Uh, um, her relationship. Yella too is is in here. Yella, I did kind of allude to that with Black Asp and Cresco Rainbow, but we'll probably end up talking about her a little bit more uh, yeah. with the defection. Hmm. Uh, Judder Page, Page's Commandos. Oh yeah, uh, he um, might be another one that. I guess I think Phalia is in the next book. Obviously, he wasn't inter- he was introduced in Thrawn, but I think Phalia gets some action in the next one. Yeah, uh, but I th- I think that we've covered most of the characters that. I mean, yeah, all all the Rogue Squadron there. character. Oh, uh, I guess Gavin sees Gavin quite Dark a bit Lider, of action. Yeah. yeah, um, but like all the. You know, the good thing with the EU is if they did need a Starfighter squadron, they would use the rogues and they would mention characters by name. Like, so, I don't know. That's kind of nice. And, like, Noir Ven being Luke's lawyer and stuff. So, like, most of these characters, I'd say Cor- uh, like Corrin would be the largest. Well, Zinj would be the largest. <laughs> wow. <laughs> He's a big, rude. thick fella. But uh, Corrin would be the most important, and then I'd—I pro- don't know who'd you put after that. Maybe like I'd probably put Tycho. Um, maybe I don't know. I'd, maybe I'd I'm overstating say Tycho's importance. Mirax, fair enough. Yeah, because Mirax and I guess by extension Booster. Uh, yeah. Well, both of them kind of grouped in together just because. Uh, well, with Corrin, the relate this relationship they focus on is that uh, Booster Tarek's a smuggler, and their fathers uh, Hal Horn and Booster Tarek were kind of. Smuggler mm. and Corsac nemesis is nemeses, yeah. and now that's kind of projected onto their kids for about fifteen minutes before they start flirting. And it's always yeah. like right after his scenes with the Reese, but I do kind of want to talk about that with the yikes moments instead. Yeah, it's kind of why I've been holding off a little bit. But Wedge, is, Wedge is also a good wingman. Wedge and Oral like must have had some sort of like rom com style bet, like who could make these two do the dirty because like. Like uh, I forget when when uh, when they first meet Mirax and Corin, Wedge is like, I can see you guys getting together really well, and Corin's like, I don't think so, and Wedge is like, No, man, really well. <laughs> but aren't you guys friends? No, we're just friends. You guys could be friends. But then when uh, Mirax comes out wearing his jacket, Wedge is like, Wait, what? Yeah. So I don't know if he just was oblivious to what he was doing, or <laughs> if it surprised him that it was that fast. But yeah. Uh, we'll probably talk touch on that a little bit more with uh, the, the yikes. <laughs> should we just go to Should we just go to yikes now? Yeah, I guess we don't bury the so, lead here. Yeah. So last book, uh, Truce of Bakura. Um, we talked about how Luke is basically an incel. <laughs> he's more not a nice quite. guy than incel. Yeah, he's like, he's a nice guy. Han's a Chad. <laughs> if we're gonna use dumb internet slang, Han's a Chad because he's just. With with Leia, he you know he says what he yeah, wants and yeah. he makes moves. And Luke is just like falls in love with the first girl he meets for about thirty five seconds. Yeah, doesn't even know the her fact name. That everything about their personalities shows like red flag. Totally this will not problem. work. Yeah, but but in the, this in this we get a new um, it's it's we it's Corn's actually kind of like a combination because he's a Luke in execution. But a Han in how women women feel about him. Yeah, like it was kind of weird how a lot of the female characters were presented in the book, mm-hmm. because at the very least, their first introduction is ninety percent focused on who they might be attracted to or who might be attracted to them. Yeah, or that becomes a major part of their character arc, or like yeah, the we- major part of their character arc. We were thinking, I don't think there's a single like female character in this entire story that isn't like most and 
like I'm not trying to be like social justice warrior or anything here, but like almost all of these characters are defined by like their whether Corrin is attracted to them or not. Well, the uh, wedge of security people. The thing we learn most about them is whether or not uh, Tycho or Tycho security people, not wedges. Whether or not mm-hmm. Tycho is interested in them romantically. Right. Then when Curtin Lore meets Isard, half of the yeah. focus is just on. She's uh, like frighteningly sexy. Yeah, it's just kind of <laughs> off-putting, and then yeah. it's the same kind of thing with uh, Arisi, where she just goes like super hard after Corrin, and it's like whoa. Pump yeah. The breaks there. Well, Mirax too, really. I mean, sort of more in a more in a friendly sort of way, but even Iella, like. Can you imagine if Wedge is reading this book? This is what Corrin says about a yellow with Siri. She was pretty, not as pretty as you are. And he's talking to Arisi, I'm pretty sure. But no Gamorian either. Basically yeah. saying she's not a pig. <laughs> <laughs> and then with Arisi, we have the uh, this really sensual, um, just, it's really a beautiful line. <clears throat> Corrin noticed that her flight suit was unzipped far enough to give him a fair view of her cleavage. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then immediately, like, I already mentioned it, but like immediately after, there's two scenes like that with Arisi where she's like super hitting on him and he's like, yeah, maybe. And she'll leave the room. And then uh, Mirax comes in mm-hmm. and it's just like, oh, I saw you were with the back to queen. Yeah. And first of all, don't be so catty. Like <laughs> respect other women, Mirax. Yeah, and and I, I do get the point in the chat there that like Arisi is a spy, so she's gathering that's true intel, but she is like this she's seems trying, a lot more genuine than that, and she's also trying to gather something. When Corin's not there, when Rogue Squadron isn't there, telling <laughs> like threatening Mirax to stay away from Corin and like bribing her. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that bit. That's the what one conversation between two female characters in the book, and that's what it is. Yeah. What's that the best? Test test. Or whatever? Yeah. Does not pass. No. <laughs> um But uh Even Mon Moth was not in this one to give I don't think is Mon Moth in this one at all, but I don't think so to give like that one, you know usually grounded non-sexualized female presence yeah. presence uh, but i mean it, it it all goes back you know it's exactly like you'd expect with those old um fighter pilot or not old fighter pilot movies, just top gun i just keep saying everyone's like hyper sexualized there's always the incestual like intra squadron dating uh who's the other one is it lujani and someone who Forge, are yeah yeah uh, no, it's uh well, Noara and uh, Rit. What's her name? I can't remember. I, I can't remember. The, yeah. the one from Bespin. Doesn't she die? No, they get married. No. Like they both resign and get oh, married. Oh, it's the same one. Oh, okay. She, uh, she, you don't really find out anything about Riz- her. Oh yeah, Rosati. Yeah. Yeah. Rizzotti. Because she's not a very good pilot. I think she says as much. Yeah, I think oh. uh, it was... Uh, was it her and Forge that were the, the worst? Or and or the Rodian and Forge? But the it was Rodian. some combination of them. Because Lujani is the one who gets murdered in her sleep, right? Yeah. Yeah, and they're like, she was a fighter. like. But I'm pretty sure he said like they were ripping on her pilot skills earlier. Yeah. Because she's the one who like tutoring. She's tutoring Gavin, I think. Yeah, she was tutoring Gavin on uh, hyper navigation, hyperspace navigation, or something, something mm-hmm. like that. And uh, she was like the the social hub of the group. Trying to make yeah, sure and I guess Lu- Lujani is not written, or Lujana, but she's not written as a like the other women. So I guess she's a she's a, she's more friendly with. I don't think she ever like comes on to Corn. No. Um, She's like she like tries to get him to come to the tap calf, which, by the way, guys, this book, I'm pretty sure, is the first book that we've read that actually uses tap calf in it. Uh, so there you go. Oh, yeah. But yeah, big moment. Teen, teen mom. That's a good one. Or like 
team BFF. Um, but yeah. Uh, but then she gets murdered was... in her sleep. Yeah, that was unfortunate for her. Um, one thing I do like about this book is, and really all the Rogue Squadron books, is they do have a good sense of like, you know, when they capture Borlias, you're like, man, these guys got a sick new planet that like they've got ion cannons now, like 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 things are going well. And like when they lose a fighter pilot, I don't know, they just do a good job of like making you feel like the wins and the losses of the squadron. It's like on such a small scale almost. Um that like you know, yeah. losing a pilot, it's like you kind of feel it, you know? Yeah, no, it where, was like, written really well where it was like, oh, we all expected that Corrin would die or Jace would die. But mm-hmm. instead it was this one that we'd expect to do like the safe stuff. She's not going to die in some blaze of glory. And she yeah. just, she's the one that keeps everyone together. And she dies on the ground in this super uh, non-heroic way, just in her sleep. So yeah. that does really, it, it was a really good way to set the tone for that. Uh, yeah. Especially because with the next battles, if nobody had died then they would have been like yeah. really unbelievable and kind of bad writing for just how the book was setting up how dangerous it was to be a rogue squadron member mm-hmm. but the fact that they got her killed in that way let them have the hundred or so pages to process that and just kind of focus on oh. that i thought that was really well done that might be my favorite part of the book sergio in the chat says the progress of the accomplishments feel real and earned and i, I agree with that as well yeah. Because like they do spend so much time on base that like when they do have this new awesome base where they've managed to like you know or like when they get a new starfighter you know that that's actually going to play you know a role in the battle or like so yeah when they have this new base you're like okay now things will be different like I don't know it just does a good job of making the like the big changes narratively actually play into like the smaller moments if that makes sense which yeah. is something something I really like. And uh, just kind of jumps back a little bit, but one other thing with taking Borlaeus, one of the things that I think the uh, the X-Wing books do well that a lot of other books just kind of feel weird about is how when they win a battle or take a world, uh, it's not like a lot of other books say like, oh, we've won at Borlaeus, so we've got mm-hmm. Borlaeus now, and this is our thing. But one of the big focuses on the book in uh, on Borlaeus in the book was just like, well, if we'd won that, they would have just come and take it back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, they would have. Thank you for pointing like, that out. And it's like there was a star destroyer on its way, and like, yeah, nothing you could have done. Yeah. So they, the biggest part of their plan is how do we deal with them, whether or not they're going to get reinforcements before we can establish ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that was, uh, I think, that was handled really well as well. Yeah, it's the same thing with Coruscant, like in the next book. Um, and Thrawn deals with this too, like from the other end. It's like when you capture a planet, you want to capture it with the shields intact. Like, yeah, they're like, we could bomb the shit out of Coruscant for like weeks or starve the planet out or go in and blow up the shield generators. But then, you know, some Imperial faction is going to come and like route us. Um, and Thrawn has the same thing with that uh, agricultural world. He's like, we need to capture the shields. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it brings a kind of sense of, it's not just like you win a battle and it's yours forever. It's like you've got to hold it too. Yeah. Especially where like the like Rogue Squadron is kind of, you know, extending the reach of the New Republic as well. One thing I didn't get is like when they go and meet Admiral Ak, like they meet Admiral Akbar a bunch of times. Is he bringing the fleet to meet them? Is he, are they going to meet him? I couldn't really. It seems like he's shuttling around a lot because. Uh, yeah. He's is he at Borlaeus during the first battle? I don't think he is because uh, no, I think afterwards he comes in home one. Yeah, uh, like he he does shuttle around a lot, and I think it is just him shuttling around. I don't think he's bringing. Uh, I don't okay. think he's going anywhere with home one. I don't think he's bringing the fleet. It's just because he's yeah. usually coming from council meetings as well, is what he's saying. Right. Uh, so. I assume Home One is just operating, doing whatever it's doing with its captain, and then he is going back and forth from the fleet because, mm-hmm. like, he's the he's the supreme commander as opposed to just a fleet admiral too. Yeah. So it wouldn't yeah, necessarily he's political be. stuff to do as well. Yeah. The next book kind of suffers in that a little bit more, but in this one, and Wedge even has a quote about it, like, "Yeah, we're not fighting the Death Star, but this battle is still important." It does feel like just kind of a small part of the New Republic's military. I think in the next one, you kind of lose that a little bit where they're like straight up assaulting Coruscant and stuff, but Mm -hmm. 
But uh, but yeah, I do like it's like yeah, we're not. If we lose this battle, the New Republic's not going to. Die. But if we win this, like we're one step closer to the ultimate goal of taking Coruscant. Yeah, I like when the books don't try to say too much about what exact proportion they are of the galactic forces as well because that always yeah it's better when they don't this early on like the bantam books because it's how you end up with projections of like 10 star destroyers in the galaxy yeah exactly like in the they do in one of the problems with the next one is they do do that coruscant's defended by two victory star destroyers or something yeah um so (laughs) like come on (laughs) come on guys like (laughs) That's all you got. Then you look uh, go to Dark Empire. Seventy three yeah. Super Star Destroyers orbiting Biss. Yeah. That's where they all went. Yeah. Well, not yet. <laughs> um uh, I think that covers a lot of that. Um, um Oh, I I do like speaking of Coruscant, I do like the trips to Coruscant. Um this book really gets shield right, like sh- like how Starfighter shields work and how planetary shields work. Like and they they talk about that in the next book too, but planetary shields are kind of nebulous, and if you don't really read into them, they're super confusing. Like, can you fly through one? Can you not? Because, uh, like, they land on Hoth, but that's supposed to be covered by a planetary shield. This part, this book kind of makes it clear. You can't fly through a planetary shield. When you go to Coruscant, you can sometimes, they open a section up, but then you can get locked in between two. Um, the, so, and they get it right with Starfighters too. Um, where the missiles can't go through shields, but they can overload them, which yeah. as, it's just nice that they got those kind of foundational things right, like in a book this early on. Because they do mess stuff like that up all the time. You know, Empire War even, you know, messes that up, I guess from a gameplay perspective. But yeah, there's also technically a distinction between particle and ray shields, too, right. which the books yeah. don't get into because I don't think it's really established yet. And it's yeah. always been kind of messy where yeah, I had a, some I had a, group it as just the shields and then other places like the notes, yeah. this kind, this, this kind, this with H2. Totally. I had a guy on one of my this very, very aggressive and very um, dedicated and passionate commenter on one of my YouTube channels just state outright that particle shields don't exist. They don't exist at all. And obviously they exist in the lore, but like when you watch the movies, um, I can't think of too many occasions where like a capital ship actually has a shield that is shown to stop a projectile. Hmm. There's like the hangar bay doors, but I think those are different. Yeah, and I guess if there's one thing that I can impart to all of our listeners throughout whatever run this podcast has and whatever run that uh, my lore channel has and... Uh, I, I hope this is a message you'll get behind with me here, is that uh, as much fun as it is to talk about the lore and mm. to try to suss out what makes most sense within the lore, what's the most consistent thing, I would like us all to take a moment and remember that none of this actually happened. <laughs> yeah. And... <laughs> There's no truth to it. It's so like... do not get angry if someone else has focused a bit more on one particular source over another, even if what you're trying to go for is the most consistent thing you can out of it, uh, which is what I always try to do or what makes the most sense in a given situation, that will always involve disregarding some other part of it, and it never happened. Yeah, it's just... and I have the same approach with what's canon. Like, I wish that Star Wars was more flexible about what's canon and what's not. Like, I don't think it matters. I think what's... Yes, when you tell a series of books, you want to have internal consistency. But I think ultimately, when it comes to things like video games, what's fun should be what's important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people are too, and this is partially the fault of myself, and like other lore channels like you, Corey. Like we do play a lot, of, we do pay a lot of emphasis to whether something is canon. Has this thing been recanonized or not? Um, is this new, is this Starfighter that was in Legends technically in canon? Yeah. Um, and especially with the mod where we're saying like, we're not doing this or we are doing this because this is how it is or this is how it isn't. Yeah. Like I, that plays into a lot of stuff with a lot of people. Cause they also want to see when they're playing a game, what their, what that representation is. And that's part of why mm-hmm. they're playing it. But, uh, like you're saying with games, especially, uh, there is to some extent where it has to serve 
the gameplay. And then you kind of have to, when you're trying to, if you have some reason to, if you're working on something, whatever, where you have to figure out, okay, what parts of this are meant to be part of the broader narrative? What parts of this are supposed to be consistent with the universe? And what parts of it did they have to kind of just make an allowance for the mm-hmm. type of media it is? And you can kind of get that with scales of battles and different things. You can yeah. get that with like how in The Force Unleashed, uh, Starkiller is able to do all this ridiculous crap because that's mm-hmm. just how the game treats the combat versus if you're trying to represent him in a book, what's reasonable for it to or for him to be able yeah. to do. Uh, I think Pablo Hidalgo actually put it in a kind of good way on Twitter. He said, just imagine that each of these stories are being told to you by someone in a cantina. Um, so, or a tap calf. A transmission a tap calf. from a tap calf. Yeah. Imagine you're getting a transmission from a tap calf um, from some patron. He's telling you generally what happened, but some of the details are colored by you know his perspective. Um, so that's just a kind of you know, nice way to explain little inconsistencies because if you read a battle in this book and you read a battle in legacy of the force there are similarities and there are differences in scale and how things work um but that's just i I personally actually enjoy seeing how the narratives develop like like i really get a lot of enjoyment out of looking at where topics first appeared uh how they evolved over time you know what secondary sources change things the role of the movies of the west end game stuff um and but yeah i think your point generally about not overemphasizing just little details and ultimately just enjoying and live and let live i think is pretty important yeah like my main thing is take it as serious like it's great like it's always fun to have the really in-depth discussions about like well this source says this and this is how this source fits in everything else as opposed to this other source, which we should end it like expecting some kind of internal consistency is always important, but mm-hmm. especially when the universe is made by so many different authors, so many different game designers, the writer for game X may not be as familiar with, uh, yeah. with the lore, like a lot of the empire at war, people who were writing the, the missions for that game. They're not necessarily people who have like read every EU thing. They haven't totally, uh, read every comic book. They, they haven't read any source book. And, uh it's going to be there's always going to be that level of inconsistency in everything like yeah. even about stuff that's actually happened it's very difficult to find something where every detail matches up and i guess my point is mostly just like be passionate about it but don't don't be a dick about it i guess yeah exactly yeah like what you like and same with the canon and legend stuff too generally like people assume because i talk about legends all the time that i'm one of the canon people or whatever else um like ultimately it's a fictional universe about you know flying jet fighters and space and space wizards and stuff so just ever attacking someone over what fake story in a fake universe they like more than the other it just doesn't seem necessary to me yeah like who prefers what or who thinks what happened in it yeah discuss it but don't yeah. judge over it. Um, that kind of reminds me, a, a good example of a planet that changed pretty significantly once it was uh, brought into the movies was Coruscant. They describe Coruscant in this book and the uh, Imperial Palace, very similar to how it appears in the early concept art for, um, what was the planet going to be called again? Uh, Had Abaddon. Have you ever seen that before? Um, yeah. For Return of the Jedi? So, and they describe basically the Imperial Palace as like a mountain coming out of uh, the city, which is very, very similar to what it looked like in the concept art for Had Abaddon. And I, I think the idea of it being a planet wide city was there, but not to the scale that it would be later, with like each individual tower is like a thousand stories and then built upon, you know, thousands of more stories of uh, like duct work and uh, industrial zones and stuff. Yeah, I think the a lot of the way books present it is just that most of Coruscant is a gross place to be. Yeah, where there's this nice sheen on the surface, or mm-hmm. nice sheave on the surface, and <laughs> if the second you go under that, it's like just Disgusting. gross, dilapidated stuff below all the civil servants for every planet. Yeah, another good example of that is Kashyyyk. Um, I because Kashyyyk is such a Coruscant. 
Yeah, I get such an interesting version, uh, like an interesting description in uh, Heir to the Empire and the rest of the Thrawn trilogy. Or maybe it's book two at first. I don't remember. Whenever it's in the Thrawn trilogy, we'll get to it. And then you get to Revenge of the Sith, and it's like a beach. Obviously, the rest of the, the, pl- the place is there, but it's just like, you know, you got scale, you got what's feasible to pull off in a book versus um, a movie and everything else. They really should have shown some of the scenes in Revenge of the Sith where the juggernauts were driving on the, the bridges between the tree houses. That would have been great to see. That would have been cool because that would have been perfect. Um, also, there's a mention of a juggernaut in this book. Yeah, that was uh, I was actually wondering about that, whether it was something that uh, just happened to end up with the same name, whether it was something that mm. got uh, pulled kind of like the name Coruscant did. Yeah, or if so it's just the turbo tanks were just turbo tanks until someone made a retcon them as juggernauts. So they appear also in the Jedi Academy trilogy when they're invading Avon. Uh-huh. And I think that George did pull the name, um, but not. I, do, I don't remember, but I do think he was inspired by the Legends tank to some degree. Yeah, because I, I can't remember when the first depiction, like, because there's the picture of the one on Yavin. Uh, yeah. And I think that all came out after Revenge of the Sith, but I've been, I was trying to look into it. And there might be some concept art or was, something. But... There, yeah, there could be some, like, Macquarie yeah, concept art or something. Everything <laughs> like, is concept He dr- dreamt it in a fever dream and <laughs> accidentally scribbled it on his desk or something. The USS Enterprise was actually based on early Revenge of the Sith. Concept um, art. Someone in the chat said pulled from West End Games based on concept art for Hoth. So there we go. Yeah, they were the original AT-ATs. There we go. That's what I, that's kind of what I figured. Uh, I guess uh, there's any more of these interesting bits you want to go into or if you want to just jump to OT references. Got two more. Yeah. On those. Yeah. There are two real nasty OT references that I hate and that come up over and over again. Yeah. Corellians and Odds. <sighs> Twice in this book, Corrin says to himself, what loyal son of Corellia ever had any for Odds? And then he says, don't tell me the Odds. You know, Corellians have no tolerance for Odds. Christ, we get it. <laughs> like, come on. The one that bothered me the most was the uh, when Gavin's talking about the whole Beggar's Canyon thing. Oh, and what is like, God. what Tatooine farm boy doesn't tell you these oh, stories? It's like, God. no, this was a Luke thing. This isn't a Tatooine thing. <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah, not good. I also think they really shoehorn, shoehorn references into the Katana fleet, like, yeah. multiple times. When it's basically like an old legend, like... And at one point, they're like, yeah, we told them the, we told them the Katana fleet's over here. And then another point, they say something about Rogue Squadron or something being more useful than all the ships of the Katana fleet. I'm like, OK, we get it. You've read the Thrawn trilogy. We know it's the same universe. Ever heard about any of those Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> I did think the yeah, I, th- I think Gavin as a character is OK, but some of his stuff about Tatooine's a little lame. Yeah. Like Gavin gets better in later appearances. Yeah. Right now, he kind of gets introduced as a way to like shoehorn in references to uh, to Biggs Tatooine that yeah. horrible line for Wedge. Like when they don't focus on that, he's like he's a really yeah. interesting character. Like this, really, uh, uh, he's got these connections that he doesn't really uh, like. He even talks about how they feel very different to him. And how mm-hmm. it's good to start getting involved yeah. with this, and how he's really enthusiastic, really skilled, but he's a young kid getting into all this stuff that he doesn't quite understand. He doesn't really comprehend uh, totally. Lost the same way. Uh, but then you get like, I'm gonna bullseye Juan Pratt. Yeah, and I mean he is kind of a stand-in for Luke too because he's what, 17 or 18. He's really young compared to everyone else. Yeah, I think he's 16, um, which was 16. Yeah, felt a little bit so. young for this too. Especially yeah, with how he, Star Wars aging works. Yeah, and I kind of remembered him as being a crack pilot, but in this book, he's really not. They really just like, hammer on him. Like, oh, you didn't kill Yeah, because he gets, like, no suck. kill in the first... You didn't, you didn't murder a person today? <laughs> you sure you're in the right place? Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do like later on in Legacy of the Force when he's, like, a... He's, like, an admiral or a commander at that point, and... 
He defies Jason in some really funny ways, just like inconveniences him. Like Jason's like the force is communicating with him. He's like, got to move these fleets across the galaxy or else the huts are going to screw shit up. And, uh, Gavin's basically not returning his calls. <laughs> it's like, make him sweat a bit. <laughs> Piss off the Sith Lord. <laughs> yeah. He could choke me across the galaxy, but. I think there was something uh, else with that, but he, he does become the, uh, the leader of Rogue Squadron after Wedge and Tycho. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cause all the, all the mains, all the main heroes retire and unretire multiple times yeah wedge is still flying his x-wing at like 97 years old yeah guaranteed like, it's like lando needs someone to help kill some or help him with the mining issue call up wedge like yeah that like Tycho and wedge even have a few conversations about how oh are we old men in a young men's game now and then no yeah 40 years later this is literally what you're going yeah. to be doing and you're still going to yeah. be the best at it yep yeah, it's Other yeah. Than the Jedi all, that are all flying around at that point, and are just way, way better than you, like embarrassingly better. Really, actually, a lot of the newer Jedi they don't get. That's there's true. Kip, there's Jaina, and there's Zek. They really get highlighted as the the best pilots. I think I'm probably forgetting yeah. something. Like, Tessar is all right. Uh, yeah, Sab is all right, but Jason is good too. Jason, it's never like he's still not as good as Jaina at that, at least. And Jaina's the better. Well, he has the moment in uh, Legacy of the Force where he goes like full when he's got uh, Alana in his ship with him. He goes pretty ham there. And Luke, of course. um, But even with all that, you still have like Jag. That's yeah. Jag seems to be like better than Jaina. Yeah. Yeah, or at least they're maybe. close. Like those two are usually yeah. the best in the galaxy at that point. Like I kind of yeah. have as the the yeah. new on and wedge. Totally. Well, that's like a problem that like, yeah. Like I, I was reading Fate of the Jedi three a couple days ago, and there's a scene where Han gets a fist fight with two Mandalorians, and he's like in his mid seventies, and he survives, and he knocks one of them out. They're wearing full Beskar armor. And Han punches one in the the throat or something. It's like these people are too damn old to be doing this. And Leia is like, just, I just imagine. I, we, I think we had the exact same conversation, but just imagine like Carrie Fisher, like how she existed as like a fifty or sixty year old, doing like the backflips and shit that Leia does. Is it, like the books kind of lack. Uh, they don't let the characters age very gracefully. No. <laughs> well. You kind of get that with uh, the senator and his wife in the last book. Yeah. Well, until she gets her memories back. Then she's like kicking ass at 130. So. Yeah. Wielding a blaster. So I do find it funny in this book. They say um, when because Jace's grandfather, I think, is dying at the end. And it's like back to can't heal aging. It's like go to the right planet. It pretty much can. But we never really get what his actual age is because he could be That's like true. 150. Probably Maybe is 300 years old. Yeah. I don't think it's that a lot of people are saying uh, it's slower aging in Star, but I don't think it's necessarily that it's slower. Just that a lot yeah. of the side effects are worse or side effects Lessons. aren't uh, aren't as bad and you live longer because the actual diseases aren't going to yeah. be a problem. Yeah. So like 70 year old Han is still 70 year old Han. Like he's a really fit guy because yeah. he's fighting all his life, but he's still. Yeah. Like there was a there was a video on I think Reddit a few days ago of uh, a former Marine just I think he's in his seventies and he's knocking out a bunch of twenty uh, yeah. guys trying to mug him and like that yeah. can absolutely happen. What we're talking about on fighting like warriors in their prime wearing full yeah. armor, punching them out. Where it's and we're also talking about Lando, who's like probably like ridden with space STDs. <laughs> first of all like he spends half his life in a casino and like he's what older than han like so yeah. yeah lando's i think a few years older than han who's a few years years older than luke and leia luke yeah yeah uh we are way off track um oh another ot reference riv shield is mistaken for Lack Shivrak, who is the uh, Shishtavanian in the uh, 
the Tatooine Cantina. I don't know. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> How many systems does he have the death sentence on? Uh, Riv actually has a, he does have a death mark because <laughs> that's like where it comes up. Yeah. Um, uh, so anything else you want to talk about from the book specifically or, um, we did say we do book rankings, so we'll see how yeah. Rogue Squadron I, and Teresa Bakura stack up. <laughs> I do like how, uh, they've got a year of more Palpatine across the Imperial, like across the empire, but morning. then. The morning is still continuing on um, Coruscant. I think that the don't the Royal, the Royal Guards, Guards have like, the, the the band from it still and curtain. Which I think is I think it's kind of cool. We didn't really talk too much about curtain lore this episode. No, we didn't. And her play, but or Gil, that's or... going to come up a lot more with uh, the next couple books where Isard's plan with that is going to come more into play because this is we're going to be talking about the whole X Wing series, so some of that yeah. stuff makes a little bit more sense to bring up. Uh, when some of it starts paying off a bit more. Right now, all I can yeah. really say about Lore is that he's kind of an asshole. Uh, yeah, that's putting it lightly. What do you think of the scene where he uh, he does like the really complicated, I guess, it's not like math, but he, where he, he, he figures out where Rogue Squadron is based on like hyperspace vectors and stuff? Uh, it was kind of... It was, it was, it's, it, yeah, it's... It was kind of like it. It's you kind can of get where he's cookie. coming from, but yeah. as, my big problem with it was that they spend all that time talking about like how they're doing separate jumps so that they can't be tracked that way. Yeah. So you'd get like that totally. section of the initial jump, but he shouldn't be able to track as much as he did out of it, or he should at least know it's not going to be that reliable. But part of it he, is that his whole. Yeah, he's a bit of a character. He's like a character. Um, same thing, like. It, it's the same thing with like uh, Isard. She becomes one aspect of her that she's fiery and cold like her eyes. <laughs> and then um, Curtin is like his intelligence in like his like he's a, basically a robot. Like the thing with Gil Bastra, I thought was a little silly. Yeah. Um, with the disease and whatnot and a little hard to follow as well. Well, I think a lot of that was just to set up all the back to issues yeah, he was basically just I think a, right. a MacGuffin for mm-hmm. all that. But uh, but yeah. So do you want to just jump into what you thought about this compared to Teresa Bakura? Sure. Will we be arbitrary and reductive in our <sighs> ranking of these books? Yeah. So I like it more than uh, TTAB. I mean, I enjoy both books, but this one feels m- much more like Star Wars. Yeah. The Teresa Bakura, like it was so early on and it's just really missing a lot of what we would come to expect in a star Wars book. Um, but yeah, I, I like the characters in this. It's very, um, it's not a Nobel prize in literature winner, but I find it really enjoying and it's basically exactly what you'd want from a, from a star Wars book, which is enjoyable, pulpy, really easy to read, but with enough depth in there that you can still as an adult, I think read it and have a good time. So it, right now in our rankings, this would be number one. Choose a Pakura, number two. I'm curious to see whether I'll like Wedge's Gamble. Yeah, I think uh, I'll co-sign everything you just said. Uh, oh, okay. It definitely feels a lot more like, or not a lot more like Star Wars, but it ha- it hits on all the things you'd expect uh, Star Wars book to a little bit better than Choose a Pakura mm-hmm. did. Uh, introduces a lot of new characters who kind of... Uh, They'll be showing up a lot with everything we're doing for the next little while, and unlike Trusa Bakura, which was... Uh, Trusa Bakura could have... I, I think my opinion of Trusa Bakura might be a little bit higher if uh, if the Sea Ruby had sort of paid off a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But that book is a lot of setup for the end battle with the idea that they're, the Sea Ruby are going to be this other great threat, but then that never goes anywhere. So yeah, other than the it doesn't feel like a H-292. full it doesn't feel like a full arc. But when we evaluate this, we evaluate it as an introduction. Yeah, we're kind of evaluating. Um, you know, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, like if if we had this, if we had Rogue Squadron as a book, and then uh, that was it for X Wing and uh, Lore Dairy Coat, and not Dairy Coat. That just sounds like. Dairy Queen dipped ice cream cone, <laughs> but uh, Derek Coat 
and yeah. Isard, if that if they never showed up again and it was like, oh, we took Borlaeus, so we're all good, then yeah. I think that would kind of feel a bit flat in the same way that I think Trusa Bakura ends up falling kind of flat. Agreed. But, uh, it was a nice try, though. Yeah. Like, it, it's a good book on its own. It's just... Uh, yeah. It doesn't have it's, quite the same. It's not very fit. complete. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, fit totally. in quite the same way that Rogue Squadron does, and I think that's the main thing that puts it over Trusa Bakura for me. Yeah, and this is still so early on that we don't have, because Star Wars really does get populated like by a good cast of EU characters. Um, I mean, a lot of them come from Thrawn, but a lot of them do come from these books, even if it's just you know relatively. Uh, secondary characters like Tycho, there's still like little bits of the universe that we're kind of starting to pick up along the way now. Um, and especially yeah. once we pass that point where we can start talking about like Talon card and stuff, then we start having a real nice cast for the rest of the Bantam books and for the new Jedi Order, especially. And one of the things that I think changes a lot more the farther away you get from uh, the early periods of writing so not like in universe chronologically but out of universe Mm -hmm. uh you do get a bit less reliance on uh the ot references and just trying to be like oh this is how these people relate to this event from the movies like the battle of yavin battle of endor battle of hoth come up as if they're the only things that ever happened in the universe exactly 73 times in rogue squadron but as the eu starts developing the characters a bit more uh you start seeing a lot more of just allowing them to be their own entities. And totally. I feel like uh, that does happen a bit more towards the end of the X-Wing books. Uh, and That's also a complaint for some people, though, too. Yeah, and I can see if you're just looking for, like, I want more of this, then yeah. I like the more it yeah. gets away from just feeling like it has to rely on those references, uh, yeah. you could lose something for that, for people for that. But for me, kind of... allowing it to breathe on its own is kind of where yeah. i go most it depends whether you want the universe to be its own thing or to just supplement the ot and i think if you do want it to be its own thing books like this and you know big arcs like this like the the rogue squadron and the wraith squadron arcs are great little foundations for the world and they're still early on enough that they have that kind of early i really appreciate the early star wars um feel to it i guess and i'm kind of excited for yeah um, courtship of princess leia when we read that, when is that chronologically? We didn't miss it, did we? I don't think we missed it. I think it's between two of the books. It might be between Back to War and uh, no, not Back to War. No, Back to War pull? and uh, right, because it's when Zinj dies. Yeah, right. Back to War and Iron Fist. Zinge just killed it. Right. Um, or no, it's after. It's after Iron Fist then. But yeah. yeah, so we have wanted... is the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we should mention though. I, I was kind of thinking about this after we announced that we were going to do um, X Wing next. We did skip Shadows of Mindor, um, but that's kind of a book that you can read later on because yeah. it's like it's a very quasi... weird book. So yeah. I, because it, even in universe, it's not really in universe, right? So it's, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. something that I feel like we should jump back to after later. we've kind of established what's really going on in the in the period mm-hmm. and kind of compare that it's very different tone mm-hmm. some of it, it it's like a holodrum isn't it yeah 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 uh but let's see and we can do the same thing with the tales book too especially like i don't want to like some of them take place over um different periods of time yeah I've never actually read the... Uh, I don't think I've ever read the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy. So we missed that as well. Not a big deal. I, I've, never, I've never read them in my entire life. I don't think they're... I don't think they're between Truce and X-Wing, are they? Uh, according to this timeline I'm looking at, they're... Let's see. Uh, that's... This follows Boba after he escapes the Sarlacc, so... Huh. So I, I think that's bef- technically parts of it are before Truce of Bakura. Yeah. And then. Right. So maybe we'll read that. It's kind of point. right before Truce of Bakura. Hmm. Like, I think parts of it okay. do extend till after, but it. Together, I'm not, I'm not too fussed about, meeting, yeah. about missing those. Should we want to give a brief overview to the people? Uh, do you want me to do it of the books we'll probably read next? Uh, 
uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh. So, I mean, I, I think we were talking too, like we might take a week off from or a, like a, a episode off if we have something specific we'd want to cover. But what we were talking about is we'll probably do X-Wing and then Princess Leia. Will we do Tatooine Ghost, do you think? Because that's kind of a weird one. I think it was like chronal. Yeah. There'll be some like that where we'll probably find a better place to fit them in. Yeah. Uh, Cause Tatooine ghost. We could read that after the duology. Couldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. I was even thinking that you can either fit it in there. Or you can fit it in. Uh, we could put it between like NJO and dark nest even. Oh yeah. That would work. So, um, all right, we do plan to cover basically as much as possible, and we'll mostly yeah. be going chronologically, but just because of the way things were written, uh, mm. sometimes it'll make a bit more sense for us to jump around like that, uh, and there might be weeks where we're replacing the chronological episode or something. Uh, it's also yeah. possible there'll be weeks where uh, there's no scheduled episode where we'll do one to cover something yep. else. Uh, like if something if new comes out, we can do that as well. But. What, what do you think about Dark Empire? I think we should we should do it. Yeah, we should definitely do Dark Empire. Uh, but we might yeah. combine a few all bits three of them. them yeah yeah rather than trying to do something on every individual issue or yeah i agree um so i'd want to do marvel the marvel comics at some point as well but oh the original ones it'd make more sense to kind of combine it and do like a mega show on that or uh, yeah talk about that and especially with 108 yeah and which was really good by the way i don't know did last episode come out before 108 was released? Can't remember. I think it was right around the same time. Yeah, I can't remember if I had read it yet. With, uh, with Star Wars Theory the week explained. after. Or was it explained? Yeah, yeah, my bad. So many of us. Yeah, I know. Uh, but yeah, it was really good. If you guys haven't picked it up, you should. Uh, uh, but yeah, so we'll probably do Dark Empire. We'll pick up some others. Uh, and I imagine some, of, some series, like... We could probably do a dark nest video let's be honest if we wanted yeah um, but if we want to I mean, have like if we want to yeah. have uh the jake and the jake and jason solo extravaganza that we clearly we clearly need in our lives true we really want to combine all that especially when we're two hours into the first book of the rogue squad of uh x Wing. yeah series. troy denning has also indicated to me a willingness to uh to talk or to have an interview nice. so maybe we could get him on for something that'd be <laughs> at some point cool. what about like Star by Star, I think, would be be awesome for yeah. Troy Denning. That was, uh, I think I've told you, I don't remember if I said it on the podcast last time, but I think that may have been the first Star Wars book I read. Uh, it was definitely one uh, of the yeah. first. Yeah, uh, it's super weird. <laughs> which is like right in the middle of the use of Vong books. I think it was something where... Uh, Anakin just, just die again? <laughs> I, just, I, I don't know that I, I'd read before, but or what I'd seen before, but I was just getting into Star Wars... And mm-hmm. I was reading a lot, and I found out Star Wars books were a thing. And I think my mom found like five at in a bundle together, and it was like one used one NJO book, uh, mm-hmm. which I think was Star by Star. It might have been Destiny's Way, uh, mm-hmm. and then there was like Shatterpoint in there. One of the Med Star duology as well, I think. That's so an it was, eclectic collection. Yeah, eh? it was. It was definitely not uh, an officially sanctioned uh, yeah. grouping of the books, but. <laughs> It was the first but, one that I ever saw was um was Lando Calrissian in the Flame Winds of Ocean. They yeah, were that, I can was, see how that would have ruined yeah. every other Star Wars book for you forever. Well, I, I, I didn't read that, it right because it was in the back. It was like I just remember my grade six teacher had like a revolving thing with books in the back that you could take out and read any time. I just remember seeing that. I'm like Lando Calrissian in the Flame Winds of Ocean and the Mind Harp of Sheru. Because he had, I think all three were there. And I just remember me and my buddies being like, this is so strange. And like, as we still kind of laugh about it, but now I've actually read them. <laughs> I was just getting into, into Star Wars with like, ep- right as episode three was coming in. So uh, I watched episode one and two with my cousin. And episode three was coming out. And my teacher at the time was like grade six, seven, or eight. Because mm-hmm. I had the same teacher all three years. Uh, where he was super into Star Wars too. And then he found out that I... Just started getting into it. So when uh, episode three, the first trailers were coming out, I think that scene with Obi Wan and Anakin, the part of the duel where they're standing on the table spinning their lightsabers for no reason, 
uh, I think that was included in one of the trailers. So he's like, oh, no, they yeah. do this thing. It makes no <laughs> sense. So he pulled me to the front of the class <laughs> and has me stand in front of him so he can demonstrate what this thing was that they were doing. And oh it was God. a very formative experience for me. It was very weird. <laughs> Is that where you developed a distrust for authority? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so that, that's... that's always good to have Star Wars nerddom called out by the teacher in front of your whole middle school class. But anyways. My, my buddy went to law school with the uh, Star Wars kid. Or the Star Wars kid went to law school before him, but he's aware of him. <laughs> uh, the broom video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor guy. That's shit on yeah. by the internet for something that literally everyone has done everyone did. if you well, never used a broom as a lightsaber but did you record yourself no or did, with, did he, yeah anyway all right let's just let's just dedicate this episode to broom kid six seventh eighth nine eighth grade you and any other kid who has been made feel bad about their love of star wars just gonna dissociate yourself from this grouping of people Oh no no no! I I gotta think of a no one. Uh, like I was in I was in the uh, the gifted class at the time, so it was a whole class full of nerds Ooh, and never leaked out to the to the rest of the school. So I was okay, yeah. but it was still a dangerous yeah. situation. But uh, I was actually thinking just to get back on the topic of the podcast yeah. for some reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, what could work is if we just go straight through uh, X Wing to Solo Command. And then mm-hmm. instead of doing uh, the courtship of Princess Leia right away, we could go into uh, we could do the Thrawn trilogy then, and then mm-hmm. do courtship. But it that makes on sense. How, just because it's yeah. so much more connected, yeah. and we could yeah. fit in Isar's revenge with the like right after Solo Command. Yeah, so we get like we the do... main things that were super formative, and then in. Dark Empire, then Jedi Academy. Yeah. Okay. Just for, for our first episodes to get people an idea of the stuff that like really shaped what Star Wars would be and then yeah. fit in some of the supplementary ones. That makes sense that. to me. But cool. uh, yeah, we'll we'll figure that out, I guess, when we're not actually. Yeah, and give us your podcast. feedback, guys. What like you guys want to give us. One thing we talked about, I can't remember if this was on stream or not, but when we get to NJO, we've got nineteen Um so like Force Heretic, there's three of them. Right, we might as well group them all together, or like Edge of Victory, the duology, or I think except for Vector Prime, I think the first four books are duologies, and then there's Balance Point, and then there's another duology, and there, there's lots of ways we can group it up. Let us know if you yeah. want us to do so. Um, it will it'll be years. tougher for us, yeah, in, in a while. We we might as well move this to weekly eventually, Corey. Yeah. Depending on our schedules. That's a but, risky move with a podcast. You don't hear about too many weekly podcasts, but I'd be down with that. No, it's it's very rare. I'd be I'd be willing to entertain that option, but uh, for me, it like counts partially as working too, because I get half of my ideas just from reading. So yeah, I mean, for both of us, that's really yeah, exactly. I should actually big moment for the channel because I think this uh this live stream will bring my channel over the 4,000 required watch hours to monetize my go. channel. So a month from now, when go. that get approves, or gets approved, assuming it does, I might actually get paid for doing my job. That'd be great. I can do more videos. Huh. Wouldn't that be special? Oh, let's see, if, let's see how YouTube reacts. Oh, I should do just... Uh videos of people reacting to star wars books that would be that's a good, i mean that's kind of that's what this cool. is but it could be like just a ripoff of the fine brothers oh yeah <laughs> have a random old lady sit down and read <laughs> my grandma section. reacts <laughs> to the truce of Bic- <laughs> <laughs> what's a tap calf <laughs> what's a no gree <laughs> what the hell's a vornsker She's got great pronunciation for someone that's just reading <laughs> yeah, me for the first time. Damn, she man. really does. Yeah. Um, is there anything you'd like to end off with, Corey? I think I think we're pushing. Uh, yeah, um, we definitely our goodwill here. Yeah, we've the last hour of the podcast is unnecessary, <laughs> but I'm I'm good. Anything you want to bring up? Nope. Anything you're excited for on your channel? Like any any big videos or the mods or. In your personal life that you want to talk about? Okay, well, uh, apparently I'm getting my grandma into Star Wars books, so that's that's a big personal life thing. 
Very uh, good. Got a video coming up this weekend on the longest living survivors of Order 66. Okay. Uh, the, Who's that? Well, that's going to be in the video. Is it a tree or something? There might be some trees involved. I don't want to give away too much. There's at least one tree involved, isn't there, Corey? There, there is one tree involved and a sweet hat. Just are there any under? Are there any people in a um, in a black hole? <sighs> people That's... in a maybe some sort of station, some sort of sinkhole station. Um, well, maybe. Okay. So I'll just I'll just slow down here. Okay. But we've also uh, got the Imperial Civil War beta going on for uh, Thrawn's Revenge mod for Empire at War, uh, where we're trying. Is to the beta public bugs. now? So, not or yet. Is it There's still, some bugs okay. that we still need to fix before we do that. But in a couple of weeks, it should be fully okay. public. But what else? Uh, yeah. What have you got going on? Any any game companies um, bring you anywhere recently? <laughs> no, I did just come back from LA. If you guys follow me on Twitter or YouTube, you might see that. Got to play Jedi Fallen Order, and I can talk about it now. It was pretty awesome. I did a whole video on it. I'm excited. Uh, I was pretty critical of the trailers. I still do think the trailers were pretty bad, but after trying the game, I'm feeling pretty positive. Other than that, I'm just going to try to get back into the regular schedule of videos. I'm trying to think if I got any fun ones coming up. Um, They're all fun uh, ones. What are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. But besides that, no, I think I'm good. All right. Do you want to sign us off? Yeah, well, thank you for coming out again, everyone, for our second episode here. Again, the next episode is going to be on June 27th at 7 p.m. EST on Mr. Eckhart's Ladders channer, channel. Channel. Wedges Gamble. <laughs> We're going to be covering Wedges Gamble. Uh, mm -hmm. Or again, some people have been calling in the chat Wedges Gambit, which would have been a fine name as well, I guess. The, I guess if you have any questions for that book that you want us to cover during the episode, uh, yeah. let us know. In the comments on these videos, you can uh, email us. Email please. us. We, you didn't. Did we mention yeah. this, by the no, way? No, we didn't. Ah, uh, crap. Okay. So I've set up an email for us. It's just tapcaftransmissions at gmail.com. I don't know. I haven't talked about this with Corey yet, but one of my goals is to have this be a real book club style podcast. So if you guys have thoughts while reading the book, please send them to us. And at the end, we didn't really do it this episode. <laughs> so we can monetize them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah let us monetize your thoughts uh no but but yeah but uh it would be nice to get some of your guys's input as we move on and try to um try to get a real following um yeah here i'll, I'll put it down in the chat right now if you're watching or if you're listening on podcast it's just t-a-p-c-a-f and then transmissions at gmail dot com that might get caught in your spam filter i don't know Corey. oh approve it okay i have that power there you go i'll also put it in the uh video version of the video i guess uh yeah so if you have any questions for that i guess if there's also before we sign off if there's any burning questions you guys have about rogue squadron because we yeah, never true. asked you i mean i'm not in a rush if you guys have any questions you'd like to uh to ask uh about this book Feel free. You can I'll give you 30 seconds for the chat to catch up, then I'm gone. <laughs> you have exactly one second to type your question. But yeah, so uh, if you have any uh, questions for the next book, you can email it there. You can leave it in the comments on the video forms of this podcast on my channel or uh, Eckhart's channel. And we'll do our best to bring them up. Well, I guess if we get anything like that, we'll bring it up at the start of the video next time and then ask the yeah. live chat for questions at the end. But oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, is it right? Okay, there's there's a few. Maybe we'll take two or three. Is it right for Wedge to screw up Corn's score like he did? Uh, just to briefly explain, um, they do this testing run through. Is it through an asteroid belt? It's through, it's through something, and the goal is to knock as many targets as you can. Corn's getting a little high in his britches, so Wedge sends him first, and then. Uh, feeds his navigational data or his targeting data with the rest of the squad. And the lesson is supposed to be that Corrin can, I guess that the other people can rely on Corrin and that, anyway, it, it's kind of a convoluted lesson, but it's probably a good one for Corrin to learn. I think he yeah. got really, really angry about it. And part of that's the Top Gun mentality. Um, but yeah, I thought, it, I thought it was a good idea. Yeah. So the basic idea was that Corrin wants 
to just sort of shine and be the obvious, be seen as this great pilot that wants everyone else to see him. So mm-hmm. they get scored out of 5,000, I think, yeah. on their he performance. Gets like 3, he gets about 3,000. He gets about 3,200, and then he thinks that that's as good as the squad's going to get. He goes and waits. The other people come out, and everyone has... Uh, even the worst person, I think, had 100 more than him, Lu Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... So he gets super pissed off, and eventually, I think if Wedge didn't come clean about it, then it's a bad thing to do because it's just going to screw with him. But the fact that it was within a few minutes that uh, Corrin came in hot, Wedge explained what was going on, and then didn't back down on that, I think it was a lesson that Corrin kind of needed. uh, That the score, because it wasn't necessarily... uh, there was no guarantee that these this is a competitive thing. It's not a competitive thing, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what Wedge was trying to highlight, where yeah. if your squad mates gets a better score because they're benefiting from what you did, that is what the whole point of the squad is. Yeah. So. Yeah, and it, it definitely helps the, the squad come together because even Jace is on Corrin's side for that. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a common thing for, like, uh, in that kind of situation to kind of try to unite the the squad at first by turning them yeah. a little bit against the leader, make them be the yeah. bad guy and then explain what you're doing. So just teach them that they can rely on each other. And remember Luke kind of does that in Luke kind of does that in one of the books. He's like, all the Jedi aren't listening to me. I'm going to become grand master. Yeah. And then he just, he another moment grand master that involves Corrin is forever <laughs> because Corrin threatens to quit like 17 <laughs> times. And that's yeah. one of them. Yeah. And then, Luke's like, don't worry, I'm just fooling. And then he becomes Grand Master. And yeah, because like, no one called his bluff properly. They're like, that's sweet. We need some leadership. And he's like, <laughs> call her. But yeah, I remember his character arc is actually really good with that. But yeah, yeah, no, it is. Especially when like he's up against like uh, there's other more reckless Jedi for a while. Like yeah. Kip. Kip becomes kind of the although Corn was always by the rules. Uh, that's because that's the interesting thing about him. He's like, he's very by the rules. Even when like his children get frozen in carbonite, he is in the rules or he's very legal or not legalistic, but it's the core sec. He's basically a, a police officer. So even when he is kind of a hot shot, he's still, uh, you know, uh, do it by the book hot shot. Although I guess he does deviate from that a bit here. So but we'll keep talking about that uh, in the future books. Any other questions with that? Uh, oh, there's the the kill counting too, um, but I don't know that that's they count kills and yeah, it's just fighter pilot thing I guess. It's basically Legolas and Gimli, but that's Corn and yeah, Jace. Yeah, and Corn's basically gimped because he's got a. They end up averaging the scores between Corn and um, and um, Gavin, and Gavin gets like no kills because he's a scrub. <laughs> he he was an ace by the end of the. End of the book, though he had at least five. That's kills. true. Yeah, so. that's true. Uh, I will say I was reading Alphabet Squadron. No major spoilers, but at one point they talk about one of the uh, the pilots going on seventy missions, and I was like, and it was like and they're like, yeah, he went on seventy missions. It was pretty chill the entire time. I'm like, my god, seventy missions in this book. They talk about rogues going like five, basically. Yeah. Uh... I mean, depends on what they call a mission. If the CO sends them to the fridge to get lunch for the squad, is that a mission? That's true. I don't know. Do you have to turn your starfighter on? <laughs> you got to cook the food somehow. But That's there's a true. few questions about uh, who's the better pilot. The book kind of just says Luke is the standard against which all pilots are judged. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. kind of hard to get a sense from anything other than what the book explicitly says. So I guess we kind of just have to. Yeah, I, I do feel that. like. Because Jace does come out of some of the battles with more kills, um, but Jace... Usually when Corrin has, like... Uh, yeah, he, he's, like, pulling do. double duty or something. And like, he's shot down. He got hit by an ion cannon. Um, he does get in some bad... Like, Corrin does get himself in some bad situations in this book. Um, but, I mean, he shows a lot of skill, really, in the simulator. Which, the simulator bit at the beginning kind of leads me to believe that he is the best, besides for Wedge. Yeah. And Tycho is probably. But he's also force sensitive, and yes. presumably was planned to be force sensitive yeah, the entire time. I was kind of looking for hints at that, and there's not a lot, the, but there is one he's reacting before stuff yeah. happens. Yeah, there's one where it says um, his father always told him when he gets a feeling to go with it, 
which I yeah. took to be. I, I do I do think he was planned to be force sensitive or like from the beginning. Yeah. But we like Corn's joke at the end with Wedge. So Oh uh, right. When he pretends they to be think, dead. Yeah, they think they've left Corn behind on Borlaeus and they'll have to go rescue him, uh, or more likely has just died. But uh mm-hmm. because the droid we talked about earlier had all the information on the mission. Mirax and Tycho thought the mission might be compromised. They went to wait on Borlaeus and they actually rescued Korn. And because Mirax's ship is so much faster, uh, they got back before the rest of the squad. So uh, Korn leaves one of those messages that they were recording, like just in case they die and gets it transmitted to Wedge. And basically is like, oh, I know I got left behind if you're seeing this. And uh, I thought it was yeah, a good was joke. Fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't think you'd want to do that in real life. Like that's, yeah, it gives someone a heart attack or something. But yeah. especially one thing, when you um, have uh, the commanding officer who has been struggling. Basically, yeah. Wedge's whole arc in the book is how much PTSD does he have from losing everyone? That's and a then Corrin pulls that. So, kind of a dick move. One thing we didn't talk about: there are surviving members like Wes. Where is Wes in this? He's don't they say he's off training? Uh, yeah, a lot squadron? of the other uh, old Rogue Squadron members are off training other squadron units. That's right, because it, they it, it kind it. of makes it seem like Rogue, like there wasn't a Rogue Squadron before that had been disbanded, and then yeah, I guess there was rebuilding. about two years where between Bakura and now they'd been spread out so much, and they want to rebuild Rogue Squadron. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of them come back later. I think. Uh, I was just scrolling Bobby down Wes's Wikipedia page, and there's a picture of him snuggling with a female Bothan, and it is not a good-looking female Bothan either. <laughs> Let's see if I can link that in the chat. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Uh, any last questions? I think we've covered. Yeah, there's questions with the Lusanki and stuff, but we'll go d- we'll yeah. go deep into that in the coming videos. We've got uh, we got a bunch more x-wing books to go through so we can also talk about any any remaining questions you guys have for rogue squadron uh, about this episode if you, anything comes to you and you want to email that to capcalf transmissions at gmail.com we'll take a look at that and bring that up at the start of next episode as well so i think that is a good yep. place to sign up sign off for real for now yep uh thanks for watching guys i had a really fun time talking to you um don't want to speak for uh, cory he usually rips on you guys after the stream but that's true all right. True. It's not true. Uh, may the force be with you guys. See you in, not next week, but the week after. Thanks again, everyone.